Okay, why don't we get started? I'm sure people will continue trickling in over the next few minutes. Um, so welcome to the Gym 5 Workshop. I'm super excited to be here today, excited to see all of you. By the way, please pick up stickers in the back. We have a bunch of them. Um, but yeah, so uh, uh, it's really good to be back. We were supposed to do this two years ago. It got canceled. We moved online, but now we're here and we're excited. So the agenda today, um, so for the first uh, 45 minutes or so, I'm gonna be talking about um, you know, the last two years of Gym 5 and what kind of fun stuff we've been doing, um, which of course are not things that I did, but things that my group and many others have done. So I'm gonna turn it over to them and let them talk briefly about some of the stuff that they've been doing. Then um, we have a number of contributed talks uh, throughout the rest of the day, although I think one or two we might move around a little bit. Um, and I'm hoping at the end that we have an extra, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes or so, because um, at least one of these talks uh, had to be canceled, um, to kind of talk about the community, talk about what we can do to better support the community. Um, yeah. And, and I uh, want to thank the program committee um, who helped us uh, find these talks um, out, out of the large set of contributed talks that we had. OK, uh, so with that, I'm going to get started um, and talk about the current state of uh, Gem 5. So we're two and a half, in, two and a half years into this project um, that I called uh, Re-Gym 5. Re-Gym 5 was to reinvigorate the Gym 5 community and kind of reinvest in Gym 5. And the goals of this, which was started in as summer, fall 2019, the goals were to make Gym 5 more stable, um, improve the testing, make it easier to use, add more interesting models to Gym 5, and provide validated baselines. Um, so I'm going to talk about the steps that we've made towards these things, um, as well as what we still are planning on, to, uh, on doing. There's probably at least another year or so of work for us to do um, on this project. But the overarching goal of all this was just to make Gym 5 easier for people to use, make it more usable uh, for more kinds of research. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, stability and testing and then hand it over to Bobby to talk about one of the most exciting things in Gym 5's usability in a long time, uh, the Gym 5 standard library. Uh, then uh, Melissa is going to talk about um, using Gym 5 in the classroom and some really cool stuff uh, that she worked on last summer. Um, Ayaz is going to talk about modeling HBM. Hua is going to talk about uh, SST integration. And then I'll kind of finish up with a few other little things that we've been doing and talk about what's left. OK, so um, as far as stability goes, um, starting in uh, 2020, we began doing gym stable releases of Gym 5. So no longer when you use Gym 5 were you chasing this head that was constantly changing on you. And no longer when you grab Gym 5 to start a project would you have to describe it in your paper as we got some version of Gym 5 from some time that had some bug fixes in it or something. Now you can say something like, we extended Gym 5 20, version 21.2 by adding this particular model to it. So it makes it a lot easier to communicate how you use Gym 5 uh, to other people. And probably more importantly, it also is just a much more stable base to build off of. Um, you know, whenever we do uh, releases, which, by the way, 22.0 was released yesterday. So we have a new stable release out. Um, when we do releases, we try to explain all the things you'll need to do uh, to upgrade uh, to the next release. Um, now, in between these stable releases, we've also had a number of little bug fixes. And those are things that we guarantee you aren't going to break any APIs or anything, but fix bugs um, under the covers. So one of the things that um, has really helped and us provide the stability is all the testing improvements. So previously, we had some tests in Gym 5, but they weren't run that often, and they weren't. Um, in fact, oftentimes they would fail, and people would be like, yeah, the tests are failing. Um, but now th th this is uh, much more we have a much better process in place. So not only do we have continuous integration tests, 
which run before something is committed to make sure that we're not breaking too many things. But because a lot of our tests take a long time, I mean, it's Gem 5, takes a long time to boot Linux. Um, we also have um, compiler tests, which test our compiler suites, nightly tests that run every night, and then weekly tests that run once a week. All of this is on our Jenkins server. And if you go to the Gem 5 website, you'll see this banner, which shows the current um, status of all the tests, which I believe right now is all green. So that's very exciting. So, and if you go to Jenkins.gem5.org, you'll actually see all the different tests and their histories. I discourage you from looking at the history of the tests. It's all green now. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby to talk about the standard library. Yeah. So uh, lots of you were here this morning, uh, but. Uh, if and this will be uh, a refresher for you, but those who aren't, this is all going to be new information, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when I first joined the Gen5 project, if you wanted to uh, implement uh, a simulation of any complexity, it would take hundreds and hundreds of lines of Python code. And essentially, me uh, having been thrown straight into this project, kind of thought maybe we could do stuff a little bit better, and that inspired the standard library concept. So essentially, uh, standard library, uh, kind of we think of it as having three things, uh, a components module, a simulation module, and uh, a resources module. And they all help you, uh, they, all take, they all aim to take away boilerplate and help you create Gen5, sim Gen 5 simulations in tens of lines, not hundreds of lines. So, uh, the components module is a way to build systems in Gem5. Uh, and the people who were here this morning will understand this diagram pretty well by now. But essentially, uh, we have this kind of computer shop building your own PC kind of metaphor in the Gem5 standard standard library. You have a board and you put in components to gradually build your system up to what, uh, up to what you want. Uh, and that's pretty good, but then the question comes, like, what do you run on your board? And that's, oh, wait, sorry, I'm skipping ahead here. Uh, we So this is how you can build stuff inside the standard library. So this is a very basic simulation but with a very basic, with this very basic script, you can run a completely full system Gen 5 simulation. So that's like, what, like probably 10 lines of Python code if you move all the white space. So uh, yeah, this is hundreds of lines down to tens of lines and really builds on this like build your own PC uh, metaphor. And you can also mix, can mix and connect components pretty easy as well. So in this very short example here, you can see I've got three different cache hierarchies uh, in the top uh, like 10 lines, and I can swap them in and out as I see fit. In this case, just by commenting and uncommenting which code I actually need. It's completely modular, and the complex interactions are dealt with by the standard library. Uh, and then you have the simulator module, uh, which allow which takes the stuff you build with the components and runs stuff in the simulator. So uh, again, this will be very 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 familiar to people who were here this morning. But essentially, uh, you can take the board and you can kind of program the simulator to run different things and different exit events, which can be very handy for uh, running big simulations. If you look at a lot of Gen 5 scripts that don't use the simulator module, you'll often find there's like 100 lines of Python at the end of uh, declaring your simulation, which uh, deals with things like uh, exit events and uh, handling reach of interest and swapping CPU cores. But with this, it's a lot more concise and a lot more easy to automate these sort of sorts of procedures. Uh, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on that because that, this will be familiar to a lot of you. So I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, to uh, Melissa, who uh, was a student in our group who, spent, who did this as part of our work. Uh, I'll let her talk about it. Hello, uh, thank you for the introduction, Bobby. So I'm Melissa, and I worked on the Lubio device project within Gem5 with Laura Hinman, another undergraduate, as well as Professor Joel Perkay Lupine. So to start out, we can just briefly define what the Lubio 
project is. Um, it was recently created again by Professor Joel Parquet Lupine at UC Davis, and they are a comprehensive and open source collection of education friendly IO devices. He created these with the intention to bridge the gap in computer science education that exists between teaching students about real complex devices that are kind of hard to teach within a classroom setting versus teaching them about simple, fictitious devices that, while easier to understand, are harder to take this knowledge and implement it into the real world. So these devices were originally implemented within QMU with device drivers in Linux, and they are capable of booting up a RISC-V-based uh, dual curl dual core virtual machine. Here we have a layout of what the eight Lubio devices are. So we have our three core devices on the left here, a timer, a programmable interrupt controller, and an interprocessor interrupt controller for handling um, symmetric multiprocessing. We have four IO devices, the terminal, the block device, the real time clock, and a random number generator, as well as one system device for shutting down the computer system. Again, these devices were originally implemented within QMU. So over the last summer, myself and another undergraduate, Laura Hinman, worked together to port these devices into Gem5 to extend their reach, both for computer science education and research. And we focused on booting it within RISC-V. Um, these devices were designed to be processor agnostic, but we decided that RISC-V would be the easiest um, to start out with implementing. So next we can look at just how a couple of these devices were implemented and the process we went through. We started out last summer by implementing this LoopIO RTC first, a real-time clock. Within Gem5, it's a read-only device that returns the current time in your simulation. And the important takeaway from working on this device is that it allowed us to see how IO devices in general are implemented within Gem5. So we have this basic PIO device class that most IO devices inherit from it has two virtual functions, a read and write, that allow you to communicate with the device drivers. So throughout this process, each of these IO devices had two sets of read and writes. One was for this basic PIO device class to communicate with your device drivers, and the other read and writes were for you to implement the actual functionality of these IO devices. So like with the Loop IO RTC, we have a second read function that if you were to read from the hour register, you would get the current hour in your simulation. Next, we can look at the LoopIO block device, which provides secondary storage to the system. And um, interestingly enough, was the only device that we implemented that didn't use the basic PIO device class. It instead inherited from the DMA device class, which allowed us to do extra read and writes from memory. And the two main functionalities are kind of shown on the screen here. You can either read from your disk image, the disk image that you provide your simulation, and write this information to memory. And the process is shown here. So you would start out by reading your, from your block device and then calling a DMA write function, which was um, an asynchronous call. So we had to make sure that we had um, a callback function. I think this is the important thing to learn from this device is understanding the asynchronous aspect of working with the DMA device and making sure that for in the first example, if you wanted to write information to memory, that you actually collect all that memory, write it properly before you clear the interrupt that was posed to the block device. Um, so reading from memory and then writing to the disk is a similar process where you issue DMA read request, make sure that you read all the information properly and have this callback function that allows us to know we can write to the block device and clear it interrupt. So there were eight devices in total. This was just the implementation of a couple of them. But as we went through the process of uh, porting each of these devices into Gem5, we also needed to have a board that we created in order to actually connect all the components together. And we did so by creating this loop V board, which has all the devices connected here and will also generate our device tree. And in order to do so, we actually used the new standard library that Bobby was just talking about. We had initially started by using the platform class within Gem5 that had some predefined RISC-V boards that we were able to start swapping components with as we created these devices. But the platform class was really hard to understand. Like making all the different connections in the system was not really straightforward to us. And with the new standard library, all these connections, like I think as we saw in the morning, become a lot simpler. Um, and a lot of us really cleanly generate this board here. So we have like our three core devices up in the top here, and we have our IO devices. And then one interesting thing to note about our is that we do have a Clint and Plick device that are connected in the top here, which are normally find, found in RISC-V systems. But we did say that these devices are able to run simulations just by themselves. And the only reason we left them in here um, for like 
they normally handle interrupts, but the only reason they're here is so the bootloader, the Berkeley bootloader that we used um, needs them in order to do setup properly. And after that, they're just treated as dummy variables. So from there on out, we just use the loop IO devices to run everything in Linux. So lastly, now that we've kind of defined what these devices are, we can look at how they can be used. Um, this loop v board with all the IO devices is currently in gem five, adding to this growing components library. And because this is a complete collection of IO devices that are both easy to understand and use, it can be really helpful for research in the future that wants to have their own set of IO devices. Um, and in addition, these devices were created with computer science education in mind. So if you wanted to look at a normal computer science curriculum and see how these devices could be used, you could start out by exposing students to just generally working with IO devices in a, a lower level computer organization class. And then as you move into your um, upper division classes, such as operating systems, these would allow students to write device drivers and understand what's going on in your operating systems or within your upper division computer architecture class, you could actually write the functionality of the devices similar to what we did last summer. And then the last note is that these devices did have a varying level of difficulty as we implemented them. So something like the loop IORTC was relatively simple to implement, so it would be suitable for an undergraduate level course. Whereas in any of the core devices that I didn't have time to go more into detail with, they have a bit of extra um, like functionalities that were a bit harder to understand and would be better suited for a graduate level course. But with that, I can hand it off to Ayaz, who will talk about modeling HPM2 and refactoring memory controllers within Gem5. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Uh, I'm Ayaz, and I'll be talking about uh, some recent work on modeling an HPM2 memory controller in Gem5 and the refactorization of the memory controller model that we did. So here's a brief outline of this, um, whatever I'm going to talk about. First, I'll talk about why um, do we care about modeling HPM in Gem5. Secondly, what are the current limitations uh, of the HPM model that Gem5 already had? Uh, and then what did we exactly do to improve this, uh, this model? And finally, then um, I'll show the evaluation of the model. And I'll talk a little bit about the refactorization of the memory controller model as well. So why do we care? Uh, as you, most of you would know that uh, high bit bandwidth memory devices are, uh, they provide you high bandwidth and lower power. And most of the modern bandwidth hungry workloads um, can take a benefit out of it. And as a result, it is important to have the ability to model them at a high fidelity level in Gem5. And these HPM devices usually provide you high bandwidth through multiple physical channels. So from this talk's perspective, what is important is, is, um, is to look at how the single physical channel is divided into two pseudo channels, uh, which is shown in the slide on the right side. So as you can see, there are two pseudo channels, both of which can act as independent data channels, or there are two independent data buses, both shown in the green boxes, but both the pseudo channels will be sharing the command bus, which is shown by the brown box. However, the command bus itself is divided into row and column command bus separately. So that's a bit of background. Uh, and what are the current limitations of the HBM model that we have in Gem5? First of all, um, these the configuration of HPM we have is, is basically based on HPM Gen 1 specs. Um, at this point, we actually, uh, in reality, we have HPM Gen 3 as well. Uh, the other limitations include that the memory interface model in Gen 5 does not allow you to model the read and write latencies um, um, asymmetrically. Uh, most importantly, the memory controller model we have in Gen 5, the default memory controller model, allow you to use only a single DRAM interface or control a single DRAM interface. In reality, what you want, because as I was talking earlier that a single physical channel is divided into two pseudo channels. So in reality, what you want is a single controller to be able to control two memory interfaces. So as a summary of all the limitations, um, I think this picture on the right side tries to explain that. Uh, so let's say an HBM2 device is composed of eight separate physical channels. So you need eight memory controllers to control those physical channels. But those eight 
uh, physical channels are divided into two separate um, pseudo channels. So each controller needs to be able to talk to two memory interfaces. But as the these red cross um, crosses show you that the we don't have the ability to do that today in Gem 5. You can't talk to two different memory interfaces with a single or two different DRAM interfaces with a single uh, controller, such that those two DRAM interfaces have separate data buses, but a shared command bus. So in order to fix this problem, we basically in, added a new memory controller model in Gem 5. We call it HPM controller, which is able to control two DRAM interfaces. Uh, you can actually perform parallel data accesses only if the command bandwidth is, uh, is there. And to do command bandwidth checks, we, so there's already some support in Gem 5 uh, to perform command bandwidth checks to make sure like you have enough command bandwidth whenever you wanna send a command to the memory interface. But we have obviously split this into now separately row and column command with bandwidth checks. Um, and we have the ability to model either a shared queue or a partition queue for those two pseudo channels in, the, in this HPM controller. Um, and apart from that, we, we used other tools and relied on JEDX specs to basically model a more uh, realistic HPM2 interface. Uh, there are some updates in the memory interface such that now you can have separate read and write latencies. Most importantly for parameters like DRCD and TCL. So these are all the changes we made to Gem5. And here is a very short overview of the evaluation of this new model. So uh, what I'm showing here is basic generator-based uh, experiment. Uh, in the plot, we have three different kind of traffic patterns, um, either all reads, all writes, or only 67% reads, and obviously the rest would be writes. And we are sending traffic either in, in linear fashion or random fashion. So this is for a single uh, physical channel of HBM2. And as I was talking earlier, a single physical channel, the peak bandwidth is 32 gigabyte per second. So as you can see, the numbers go pretty close to peak bandwidth. Um, and in fact, they look very similar to other um, simulation tools. Or if you do some back of the envelope calculations and then compare them with the numbers that we see here, uh, they are very comparable. So which is a good thing. Um, the, in summary, the model seems to be modeling uh, you know, the HBM2 pseudo channel behavior at a high fidelity. Finally, uh, quickly, I want to over, give an overview of the refactorization of the Gem5 memory controller. So while doing this work and while working on actually other memory controller models in Gem5, uh, we observed that uh, sometimes you want to either enhance the um, functionality of the memory controller slightly or you, you might want to change it very uh, you know, like aggressively. And uh, all of those things make the current memory controller model very complicated. So in order to solve the pro that problem, we basically now have a base memory controller which only allows you to connect a single memory interface. And then we have other classes which basically extend from the base memory controller, try to use as much functionality as possible from that. Now you can have an heteromem controller, which allows you to control a DRAM and NVM interface at the same time. HBM controller, which I just talked about, allows you to control two DRAM interfaces. And then you can have your own controller. For example, we have a DRAM cache controller, which Mariam will be talking about in one of our talks later. Um, which, which allows you to you know, control a DRAM cache. So you can add controllers of your own choice. So with that, um, I think I would like to conclude this talk. Um, and if you have any questions, I can take them offline. So I'll next invite Hua to basically talk about integration of Gem5 and SSD. Um, thank you, Yas. So, hello, everybody. I'm Ho um, from UC Davis. Um, today, I'm going to present um, the reintegration of Gem5 and SSD. So, uh, what is SSD? So, it's a simulator. So, I assume everybody here more or less familiar with Gem5. So, instead of introducing SSD, um, I will draw a lot of comparison between SSD and Gem5. So um, SSD is a simulator, an open source one, and the brand themselves uh, simulation toolkit. Um, it's a discrete event-driven simulator, which is pretty much similar to Gem5. 
and the main simulation objects are the components, the links, and the events. So components, the SSD components are um, very similar to um, sim object in Gem in Gem Five, and um, it can take parameters and you can connect them via links. So links is how you connect to um, SSC components. Um, and they, the two components can communicate via links by sending and receiving events from it to each other. Um, so the, um, the key distinction between HM5 and SSC is that SSC focus a lot on scalability and parallelism. Um, so the way they, they do that is that they partition the components into you can say as, as a multiple cluster or multiple partitions. And then um, when um, the components need to communicate, but they are in different partition or um, cluster, then the communication can be done via message passing interface, which is um, MPI, for example. And for clarification, the focus of this work, I mean, the Chen5 SSD integration is not about um, increase the par parallelism within Chen5 itself, but it's more about scaling the um, number of Chen5 instances that we can run at the same time. So um, this is the um, overall architecture of the integration. Um, basically, we let SSC be the main driver, driver and uh, we will have Chenfi object lists within um, SSC environment. Um, so um, the diagram below is an example integration between Chenfi and SSC. We have Chenfi detail CPU, and um, we have SSC memory system. And the CPU can communicate with the SSC memory system via um, the Chenfi component, which is um, a component that we met um, that Chenfi sim object in this case, CPU can send the request to that component, and then that component will send the request to the SSD memory, and then you can reverse the data path to get how the response are sent. So the, the translation between the Chem5 packets and SSD mem events occur in the Chem5 component. <laughs> So um, what can we do with this integration? Um, the cur currently, we have an upstream um, configuration system configuration that um, you can run a Chem5 timing CPU with SSC memory system. Um, so we can run that in the full system simulation mode with FreeSphere and ARM ISAs. Um, however, there's a lot of limitations in this integration. First is that there's no functional access and there's no this image. You know, um, when you do full system simulation in Gen 5, you need to have some sort of providing the user space for the system. However, we, uh, we were unable to get the Linux kernel to recognize this image. So we got around that by um, package the user space into the um, Linux kernel. And the next steps for this integration would be um, we, can, we can, we try to generalize the, um, the way that we connect, integrate Gem5 and SSD so that we can have multiple Gem5 instances um, that communicate via the SSD network. And um, so if you're interested in the detail of this integration, we provide documentation and um, example uh, configuration in this mainline Gem5. And um, we want to talk about the integration or how you integrate an external 
um, simulator with Chem5 um, in the upcoming workshop. So I will hand this back to Jason to talk about more features of Chem5. Thanks, well. So you can see we've been quite busy over the past few years. Um, I just want to talk a few other things um, that we've done. So Bobby kind of mentioned this, uh, but another exciting thing we have is uh, Gem5 resources. So we all know from doing uh, Gem5 simulations that it can be a big pain to gather everything together that you need to get the simulator going. So not only do you need the simulator, but you also need a kernel, a disk image, all your workloads, et cetera. Um, and this can be a pretty big pain to get together. So what we have is a bunch of pre-built resources for you that you can just download and use. So as Bobby showed before, in a single line, you can say, I want to use the 4.19 x86 kernel. And I want to use the GAP BS, the GAP benchmark suite disk image. Um, and it will automatically download it for you, uh, cache it locally, and then hook all that into your board correctly. Um, we have a bunch of different workloads available, mostly x86 benchmarks, although we're starting to branch out into other things as well, including RISC-V. Uh, we have both all the source to build these, so you could take it, modify it, and make it your own, as well as the pre-built binaries. Um, if you go to resources.gem5.org, it gives a web interface to this, although I use that phrase lightly. If anybody's a web designer, this would be a great way to contribute if you know how to make a website. I can give you content, I just can't make it look. Um, so yeah, th this is kind of what the website looks like. It has a documentation about how to build it, um, links to everything, and we also have example scripts that use all of these different resources. So while we've done a lot of work at UC Davis um, and in the core Gem5 uh, development, we're not the only ones that have been contributing to Gem5. There's been a huge number of contributions by the community at large um, over the past two years. So some of the most exciting, although not at all um, an exhaustive list, is for RISC-V, we now support full system. Um, we also have support for the Keystone Trusted Execution Environment. And we are in the process of getting RISC-V vector instructions going. Um, on ARM, I think we have up to ARM 8.4. It might not be fully compliant, but it's pretty close. We even have things like virtualization support working in ARM. Um, Multi-level TLB support, the AMBA Chai protocol, um, which is one of the most exciting things to me personally. Transactional memory and uh, support for SVE. Um, the AMD GPU has come a long way. Um, we support uh, Rockham, I think, up to 4.2, actually. The Vega ISA, which is one of the more recent AMD GPU ISAs. And very exciting, as of this release, so as of a few hours ago, um, we support full system GPU. So this means you can boot Linux, mod probe in the AMD GPU driver, and then access uh, things on the AMD GPU. And everything just works. Um, which is pretty cool. And since the last workshop, which was two years ago um, at the virtual ISCA, we've had almost 130 unique people contribute to Gem5 um, and 3,800 commits. Just actually, this is probably probably more than 3,800 now since the release. So what's left to do? Um, the thing that's highest on my priority list is validated baselines for things. So what we want is to provide you known good configuration. So Bobby talked about how a board is you take components and you plug it in. Well, what we want to do is have pre-built boards that we've tested against some real piece of hardware and tell you, well, the hardware took you know, a million cycles to do it, and this pre-built board took a million and 10 cycles, or something somewhat close to what the hardware is doing. Um, these pre-built uh, boards will be tested on every Gem5 release. We'll report the numbers to the community and say this is where we are against um, these things. And most importantly, we'll have a well-documented methodology, so bringing up a new one, bringing up new workloads, a new um, hardware to compare against, or a new pre-built board um, will be easy. We also have a lot of other things we want to do in terms of improving usability, things like better testing, 
um, and improving the documentation. One of the things I'm really excited about, um, you all may or may not realize, but in a couple of weeks, we're going to run a Gem 5 boot camp at UC Davis. There's going to be a week-long event um, of getting from getting started to Gem 5 all the way through how to develop a Ruby protocol in Slick and how to add new instructions to the ISA, new CPU models, um, and everything in between. Um, so we're excited about that. This is going to be the first time we do it, and I'm quite confident it's not going to be the last. I think there's going to be a lot of excitement um, after doing this. So the last thing that's left is continuing to grow the Gym5 community and building this sustainable um, infrastructure. And one of the things that I'm really looking for, and I'm looking at you all to do this, which is to help by having more community engagement. It's, you know, more things like this, uh, more workshops, more tutorials, um, and find ways for you all who are interested in Gym5 to give back. You know, code review, contributing to Gym5, um, et cetera. And one of the things that um, I'm excited about, we'll see how it goes, but I want to improve the communication between everybody in the Gem5 community. Um, and so I've set up a new Gem5 Slack. Big announcement today. Um, so if you go to this website, tinyurl.com slash Gem5 Slack invite, um, you can be invited to our um, Slack group and come join the conversation um, with the rest of the Gem5 community. I'm also really um, open to fresh ideas to uh, improve, uh, to encourage more collaboration. So if you all have any ideas, uh, or, or if you have um, reasons why you're not contributing back to the Gym 5 community, let me know. I want to improve things. And so in the end, I want to say Gym 5's future is really bright. I think we are entering into this virtuous cycle where we're making Gym 5 better, which means we get more Gym 5 users which hopefully means we get more people in the Gym5 community, which further improves Gym5. So I think we've kind of hit our stride into this cycle, and I see um, really great things uh, for the future. So with that, um, I'll end here, and we have a few minutes for questions. Tom. Yeah, it's a good question. So the question was, for the Loop.io devices, um, can we have a performance model and not just a functional model? Absolutely. And I think the block device is an example of that, where there is a real timing delay, even reading things off the disk. So you get a request, you get an interrupt, and it might take some time before you can read some things off the block device and then start the DMA transfer. Any other questions? Yeah. Getting Primer from Google. Uh, I'm curious about the SSD presentation. Uh, I didn't follow exactly what is the added value that SSD brings in. And if the reason added the value, why not to integrate that into the Gem 5 ecosystem? Why, why, why the building is. Uh... Yeah, so the question is what, what, what's the added value of SST? Um, I'll give two answers, what, what, one a little snarky. Um, people use SST. So we integrated it. Someone asked us to do it, so we did it. Um, but the real reason is that um, it has much better parallelization support than we have in Gym5. Um, it was really built from the beginning to be able to scale to the supercomputer size systems, because it was built at Sandia for doing um, supercomputer, uh, for simulating supercomputer networks. Um, you know, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, and I think Wal was kind of hinting at this, it doesn't make a lot of sense to use Gym5 cores and SST memory system. Um, we're not really taking advantage of much parallelism there, and it's kind of a weird mishmash. I, I think the other thing he was talking about, which is some of our future work, is like, if you had a node which is Gym5, you could then scale that out to running many nodes in parallel that are communicating via SST, which they've already figured that out really well. One more question? Yeah. 
OK. Well, if there are no other questions, um, next up, we have a talk from uh, Chris Batten at Cornell, who's going to talk about packaging Gym 5. And he may or may not know this, but this is a very controversial topic for the uh, Gym 5 development community. Let me hand you the microphone. Okay, uh, thanks Jason. So my name is Christopher Batten, I'm at Cornell, um, and this is a joint work with uh, uh, some of my colleagues at Cornell, but also at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Uh, and so these colleagues and I are working on this big project related to accelerating genomics. Uh, you know, Piotr and Eric are kind of world-leading genomics experts, and they're really, really big fans of open source software, and they're really, really big fans of Geeks. And Geeks is this open source packaging system, and the more they kept talking about it to me, the more I thought, hey, this might be useful in the architecture community to solve some of the problems we face. And so today, I want to briefly maybe make the case for possibly geeks may possibly be a way to solve the Gen 5 packaging problem. So what is the Gen 5 packaging problem? And some of this was already hinted at already. Uh, so let's say you want to do an experiment. You start with your Gen 5 source code. You're going to need a modern C++ compiler. You're going to need to make sure you have the SCONS build system ready to go. And you're going to need a bunch of other dependencies that are required for the building of Gem 5. Um, and then you're going to need to, some runtime dependencies too, right? So obviously, Gem 5 also involves using Python. And there's a lot of these build and compile time, uh, these build and runtime dependencies you have to have straight in order to be able to build Gem 5. And then there's a lot of uh, build time compile options too, right? Different ISAs, different coherence protocols, different accelerators. A lot of these are different compile time options. Uh, and so essentially, Everyone just basically ends up building Gen 5 from scratch. But then once you've built Gen 5 from scratch, you now need a workload to run on Gem 5. So you've got that C++ source code. Uh, you're going to need a cross compiler, probably. Uh, whatever build system the workload under interest requires, you might need to do a static build if you're going to do sys syscall emulation. You build like maybe a cross compile binary for ARM. Maybe you want to run it on QMU, so you got to get QMU as well. And then you can finally run it on Gem 5. And so again, you know, kind of building a cross-compiler tool chain can be, can be difficult. You know, getting and building the emulator can be challenging, making sure that you can support static linking. Um, everybody just ends up doing all this stuff from, from scratch. And so we heard some efforts in this, in this vein to help address this issue. So we heard about Gemfire resources, which is a great kind of way to maybe help mitigate some of this pain. But at some level, Gemfire really has no kind of uh, standard packaging scheme yet. And if we take a step back and think about what would an ideal Gem 5 packaging solution look like? I came with maybe eight, eight goals. We want it to be reproducible, right? So we want to be able to do, deterministically duplicate, uh, hopefully bit accurately, uh, a given experiment, a given development environment. We want to be transparent. We want to know where all the source code comes from in terms of building our environment. Uh, every single uh, dependency, every version of every dependency, all the compile time commands required to build those dependencies. Ideally lightweight, we want to make it easy to use and integrate into our standard development environment. Flexible, we want to be quickly able to switch back and forth between different Gem 5 versions, different development environments. Portable, we want to be able to build Gem 5 workloads natively for testing and then easily uh, cross compile them to one ISA or maybe multiple ISAs or maybe our own bespoke ISA we're working on. We want it to be fast so we can quickly, uh, you know, quickly use packages. Ideally, distribution agnostic, so we're not coupled and force our, our developers or researchers to choose a specific distribution. And hopefully extensible, so you know, maybe uh, leveraging a general purpose programming language to allow us to extend the package man management system. And to some degree, some might argue, well, Docker helps get us a lot of the way there. And I would, you know, to some degree, disagree. So this is the uh, Gen 5 Docker, uh, Docker, uh, Docker um, file. Um, which is provided. And, and keep in mind, this is just a Docker file for setting up the development environment to build Gem 5. Um, and then once, so you have to kind of go get the Gem 5 sources. Maybe we can use the new versioning system to make sure we got a clean version of Gem 5, and then we can go ahead and build it. Does this meet all our goals? You know, to some degree, but also maybe not, right? Is it reproducible? As soon as you do app get update, you're getting a whole new version of the packages. You don't quite know what version you're getting. Um, you know, as soon as you're cloning from the GitHub repo, you're, you might not know what version you're getting if you're not using one of those stable version numbers. Is it transparent? I mean, who knows kind of what's in that big Ubuntu binary blob? Um, 
you know, and is it, is it lightweight? Well, you get stuck in this Docker container, you know, maybe you have to use Ubuntu, but I'm a Red Hat user. So you're kind of stuck using that container. Is it fast? You're downloading hundreds of megabytes to get this Docker image. So there's a lot of kind of disadvantages to this approach. Uh, you know, in the geeks community, they like to say containers are like smoothies. You know, I like a good smoothie. Smoothies taste good. You don't really know what's in a smoothie, though. It could be some delightful, tasty juice, or it could be like whale oil. You don't really know what's in a smoothie, and, and it might be hard to reproduce a smoothie. So containers like smoothies and geeks is a, kind of an alternative to that approach. So here's what I want to talk to you today. I, I want to give a little bit of background and then talk a little bit about our kind of proof of concept of using geeks for simulators and workloads. So what is Geeks? Geeks is a general toolbox for software deployment. It's not just a package management system. Uh, it is a package manager, though. It's, it's a really elegant one. It's functional and transactional. Uh, but it also can be used as an environment manager. Think about, think about it as like Python virtual environments, but for everything. Uh, it also is, it plays nicely with containers. You can think about it as a reproducible container generator. You like Docker images? That's fine. You can use Geeks as a reproducible way to generate Docker containers. And you can also use Geeks to build entire complete operating systems and manage those operating systems. So here's Hello World using Geeks. You can do Geeks pull to get the most recent version of all the Geeks packages in the Geeks upstream package repository. Uh, you can easily install packages. Uh, you can see what packages are available. These packages are installed in a global GNU store. So all the packages in the system are installed in a common space. And they all have these hash prefixes, which are some of the magic sauce of Geeks. That hash prefix is a hash of every single dependency which was used to build this package hello. It's a hash of the source file for hello, but it's also a hash of the compiler source code which was used to compile hello. It's a, it's a hash of the libc that was used to compile hello. So that uniquely identifies that specific build. Uh, you can, you can get it. Uh, of course, you can, you can use your installed hello world, and you can easily remove it. But keep in mind, Geeks is far more than just a package manager. So here's the Geeks Hello package definition. Uh, it's written in Guile, which is a dialect of scheme. It brings me back to my MIT days, lots of parentheses. But the key idea here is a general purpose programming language and gives you a lot of power in terms of how you kind of extend and manage your package managing system. So here you can specify where you're going to get the source code from. You get what you think it is support for a new build system, and it makes it very easy to build these packages. All right, so let me show you a little bit about our proof of concept Gem5 Geeks package. Um, so the actual Geeks package specification is too big to fit in one slide, so it's here at this channel. The channels are kind of where you can put uh, Geeks packages uh, that are work in progress that aren't upstreamed yet. Uh, so we had to do a, a couple different things to try to get it to work in the Geeks ecosystem. Um, so we, a, we a, fetch a specific tag, so that's good now we have specific releases of Geeks. Um, also, Geeks has a strong emphasis on reproducibility, and it has ways how you can test to see if the build is reproducible. And so one of the first things my colleagues did is they tried re rebuilding Geeks multiple times, and every time it would be a little bit different. And that's because date and time are, are basically embedded in the binary, uh, which you need to get rid of if you want it to be a deterministic build. So things like this, the package manager will essentially uh, fix up. It can patch the build system to make sure it's using the Geeks versions of all the dependencies instead as opposed to the globally installed ones. And this makes it reproducible. So you're never getting whatever happens to be on the system. You're always using the packages in the Geeks ecosystem. It leverages the built-in support for SCONs. It automatically builds uh, uh, Gem5 for multiple architectures, x86, ARM, and RISC-5, and others. Uh, it installs the binaries so you can use them globally. Uh, install some default configurations to make it easy to try out, captures all the dependencies, and also can provide derived packages if you only want to install a specific ISA variant, for example, just for ARM or just for RISC V. So this little mess of a graph over here, this is essentially capturing all of the dependencies of Gem5. So this captures the direct dependencies, but also the indirect dependencies. Uh, so the fact that, you know, the, that this relies on PyTest or these other libraries. Um, and this doesn't even all the dependencies. So this doesn't capture the dependencies on, for example, the actual C++ compiler. You start to see how it gets really complicated to actually do reproducible software development once you have this kind of really complicated dependency graph. So you can Geeks install Gem5 uh, and installs in the global store. And if we look at that hash right there, that hash captures 
all direct, direct dependencies, captures all the implicit dependencies, all the recursive dependencies. It even captures the compiler used to compile the compiler and all of the command line options and environment variables required to build Gem5 in a reproducible way. Let's talk a little bit now about the workloads that you can run on Gem5, because that's just the simulator. So this is an example of how you can extend and use the power of geeks to extend packages. So one of the challenges when doing Cisco emulation in Gem5, as those of you who have done it know, is you have to only, can you only use static linking. And so here what we've done is we've taken an upstream package called Smith Waterman. So that's for DNA alignment, uh, dynamic programming, a very simple uh, package. And uh, we have created an inherited a base derived package of Smith Waterman, which essentially just adds the static keyword to the so that we can build it as a static as a static build. And once we've done that, we can, of course, build a static build and run it natively. But you can also leverage Geeks' ability to easily cross-compile packages. So here we're doing Geeks build, and we give it a target. In this case, we're giving it the ARM target. And this will automatically get download and install the cross-compiler and then build this Smith Waterman using this static flag and install it in the global store. All those dependencies, including the cross-compiler itself, are captured in this hash. So now let me I'm gonna do like a little a little demo. So let's see, let's see how this works. All right, so here I'm logged into our, our server. You guys see that okay? All right, so um, a lot of the you know a lot some of the packages we've worked on are upstream, but some of them are not. And so for the ones that are not, those are installed in a, a channel. And so when you configure and set things up, you need to spe specify what that channel is. So here in this channels dot SCM, you can list any additional channels. So this is the, the channel my colleagues at, at University of Tennessee have set up where a bunch of their kind of work in progress packages are located. OK. So I'll check to make sure that no packages are installed yet. So no packages are installed. So the first thing I might want to install is hello. Geeks, not geese. All right. So now I've got hello. Uh, and I'm also going to maybe install um, Smith Waterman. All right. I'm going to set things up. So Smith Waterman is installed in my default profile. You can have your own profiles just like in virtual environments, and you can switch back and forth them in an easy way. Uh, and if I look and see, that, that's, a, that's a sim link. And so that's a sim link into this GNU store, which has this hash. So this is the Smith Waterman version uh, that I'm running. And, and you can, of course, run it natively. So here I'm going to run it natively. And I'm going to give it like some sequence here. G C A T C G C C S. Nope, needs to be valid. All right, and there we go. And it's detected that there's two two mismatches here. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and install uh, QEMU. And I'll install Gem5. And so this is using our kind of proof of concept Gem5 Geeks package. All right, so I do Geeks uh, package list installed. I've got my three packages, hello, Smith Waterman, QMU, and Gem5. Uh, and now let's go ahead and cross compile uh, our Smith Waterman. So uh, you can do Geeks build, and I'll do target, and I'm going to cross compile for ARM. I could also do RISC 5, or I could do x86. All right. And I'm going to cross compile Smith Waterman, and I'm going to do the static version so I can run it on Gem5. Let's see. Did I not spell that right? All right. So now I've got my cross compile version of the Smith Waterman uh, application installed. And I'm going to go ahead and put that in an uh, environment variable, this capture where it is in the store. And then I'm going to create like a little sim link to make it easier to reference to that cross-compiled 
version of Smith Waterman. And I'm going to call it SWA Arch 64. All right, so obviously I can't run that natively because it's a cross compiled ARM binary, but I can run it on KeyMU. So I've got KeyMU installed using Geeks, key, KeyMU, and I can do the ARM version of KeyMU. And I'm going to go ahead and use the same little example here. Okay, so now I just ran the cross-compiled version of Smith Waterman for ARM on QMU, and now let's do it on Gem5. So I've installed Gem5, so Gem5 ARM opt. Okay, so there it is. And I'll do... So I can go ahead and use one of the default uh, configurations, uh, which is globally installed. So gem5 configs, example, syscallemulation.py. All right, and I'll give it the command, Smith Waterman, R64. I'll give the options. Give these two sequences. All right, there we go. And so it so it worked on Gem 5. And so we could also, of course, running on timing models and do experiments. So you can start to see the power of this type of patching system. It makes it easy to install Gem 5 as a package. It makes it easy to install different Gem 5 packages. It also makes it easy to install the workloads and cross-compile cross the workloads and run them on Gem 5. So just to, to wrap up here. So I think the key takeaways points is, uh, you know, I think, most of us know that packaging the Gen 5 simulator and workloads is challenging. And Geeks is a kind of mature and well-established open source ecosystem uh, for package management. And I think it's a really interesting idea to maybe explore using it in the context of Gen 5. So uh, that's kind of what I wanted to do today. I'm happy to take any, any, any questions. It worked great. It worked beautiful. No worries. Well, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Jason. Um, what's the license on Geeks? So Geeks is like super like hardcore, like open source, free as in freedom. Uh, so it's all it's all open source. Um, but you can definitely, you know, you can put things which are not open source in Geeks. It might not get upstreamed, but you would put it in a separate channel. Is so that it's BSD? Yeah. I oh, yeah, B yeah, BSD would be fine. Yeah. Yeah, BSD is fine. Yeah. And so, you know, I didn't have time to talk about it today, but one of the key things that they're really interested in is essentially like building everything from the absolute beginning. So one of the problems with open source reproducible software is that where does the compiler come from? You need to compile the compiler, the compiler. Where did that come from? Where do you need to compile the compiler, that one? There's a whole bootstrapping process. Geeks is built on that. And essentially it starts from a, from a, from a seed of like a really simple little piece of assembly that you can understand by hand. And it uses that to essentially build an assembler, to build a fancier assembler, to build this scheme thing, to build tiny CC, to build an old version of GCC, to build a new version of GCC. And the reason they do that is because they really, really have an emphasis on completely transparent, reproducible software development. Uh, so they're very, very big into that. Okay, well, hopefully maybe some of the cool, like hardcore Gem5 developers here are interested in learning more and would be willing to maybe make this kind of part of the, the official Gem5 such and maybe get them thinking. So thanks for listening. I'm happy to take any questions afterwards if you want. All right. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so now I think it's a uh, coffee break. So we'll see you back here in 30 minutes for a whirlwind of other talks.
if you could use that so that people are ready to marry again. Okay. There are a few people that are online. Me if I can stitch there. Oof. Oof. Went. Uh, big guy, of course, so just making a force. Give me a bit. Toop. Okay, full screen. It's. Oop. Oop. Perfect. Oh. Oh, it's, oh, yeah, it's really bright in here. Good enough. Maybe why am I speaking like like here? Okay. We'll give everybody a couple more minutes to get back. I mean, I would monetize it, and we could use that for buying stickers. I do really want like an ad every like ten minutes on our videos. Is that going to drive people away? I think we have a pretty captive audience. So what's the typical procedure for adding a new thing to the upstream? Um, if it's a really, really big thing, it would be good to like send an email being, okay, I'm planning on doing this. Does this seem like something upstream would want? If it's just a small thing, um, just creating a change request on Garrett. And we actually talked to you at Micro in 2020. We did the presentation that was there, or virtually. Yeah, uh, all, but you know, all, all our stuff is kind of to the side, so we don't actually affect Chip 5 at all. We're just an editor. Yeah, we're, yeah. Um, yeah we're, The biggest thing, we're honestly, that, that we keep meaning to do is we have it's a substantial code base, and getting it into <laughs> the, the formatting that is expected yeah. is big complaints. So we don't think so. I wish that didn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we would have just started with like in the beginning with the concept of what we're doing, but now yeah, we're like 40,000 lines in. It's like, yeah. Well, I mean, one thing we could do is um, figure out how to get it integrated with extras. Okay. Oh. So it doesn't have to be necessarily in Gen 5 source. Sure. Um, and can be integrated easily. Um, we could also um, do the same thing we do with like DRAM, SIM, and SST, mm -hmm. which is we add tests that test for it, mm -hmm. but those tests go download the external tool and build mm -hmm. it and then test it. So I think that extra is probably the best place for yeah. it. Because it really is more like yeah, totally it's, right. it's Gem yeah. 5 Salam, Salam being separate from Gem 5. Yeah. It just interfaces with Gem 5. Yeah, let's talk more later. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Let's get going. She got a few people. So, um, okay, oh. so we have a bunch of talks. Um, I'll stand over here. So we have a bunch of talks coming up this afternoon. Um, the first one is uh, Quentin Pocholi um, from Telecom IP Paris. Telecom Paris, IP Paris, same thing. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, using Gem5 and doing uh, security and penetration testing. So, first, uh, maybe I didn't plan that someone would mention first in execution environment before. So, if one of something that I wanted to introduce that uh, what is a trusted execution environment and what is, is it useful? Because the, the T in OPTIS is an obviously for trusted execution environment. So, first, 
we have all the problems that SOC are facing many security threats because of child reduction context, increasing number of critical applications, the fact that some devices are, are locked and, uh, and are have regular updates, Incre and increasing, co and increasingly complex OS, OS in devices, and new vulnerability we already discovered. So it's, you can't consider that the normal execution of your environment of, of inside an SOC is safe and could be safe for any long, any sufficient amount of time. Could you but, use this mic here? Ah, this one? Yeah. Okay, also. So, so we, so uh, trust, that's why trusted execution environment exists. It's, it's for protecting an execution against attacks and leak, guaranteeing, guaranteeing confidentiality and integrity, hiding, hiding side effects and all. We have simple, there are examples as, as physical enclaves that are secure, simple, uh, separate processor and uh, software enclave, you, you choose the same processor, but use an extension to protect, uh, to, to, to prevent those effects. So OPSI is an open source trusted execution environment that use ARM v7, v7 and v8. It is supported by Trusted Firmware, Trusted Firmware Orc, which is a consortium uh, which features ARM, for example, and use a, T, a, global, a global platform TI API, which is also another consortium that, that develop APIs, and it relies on ARM chosen functionalities. So what are ARM what does ARM chosen add? It adds, it adds uh, higher exception level, which uh, in ARM it's for, it, it works reversely from uh, Intel. Higher exception level are more secure, lower are more use more user. And it do, so the LZO is a user exception level and the L3 is an higher exception level. And it duplicate L1 and LZO, which L1 was the kernel execution level for uh, ARM and create a trusted version of those two execution level. This version, the version has the possibility to, to, to label trans, uh, memory transaction inside uh, XI and inside cache, and, uh, and based on this label, devices and cache can enforce some property. This, the program that run inside OL3 is called the Secure Monitor. It has several role, payload dispatching. Uh, some, it, it can lock some, some access to, per, to performance functionalities like the, the, the dynamic vol, voltage frequency scaling. It, uh, it, it uh, implements exception trapping and secure monitor calls, and also uh, some, some things, and firmware updates and other things. So how, how we can how we can use Opti with Gen5, and how we can build, and how, how, be, how to build uh, application. So Opti uses uh, the, the, the exception level this way, set, setting up <coughs> using a normal, a normal, a normal OS in a normal world, and having a specific driver that implement that allow client app running in Linux to uh, to interact with with Opti, and it allow it can run trusted application which are feature in contain which are application feature in container and also can which can be encrypted that run in L0 and communicate through a message passing through the L3 using a, which is called the secure monitor call which is the same that the service call but for the secure monitor. Typical use cases for Opti, there is two, two typical use cases. During boot, you can run some functionality through platform code, through specific platform uh, scripts that allow to check using, uh, to check some, some, some platform property during boot or set up specific key uh, during boot. And after boot, you can implement through the application, crypto pro cryptographic protocol, digital management software, and total property protection, this type of, of, of application. To run Gem, to run Gem5, to run uh, Opti with Gem5, you, you did several, you did several things. I have first needed what I had to do was to fix some of the of the Gem5 bug, especially uh, something around exception level uh, exception level change, which wasn't uh, after that we fixed again. We fixed a different way by, by Gecko but. And also, you have to add these kind of device, which are already I didn't know, which are already known in Gem5, which is a trusted DRAM and, and some specific DTB, DTB firmware nodes. There are also coming fixes which we are trying to, to, to commit. We are just preparing, we're preparing to commit 
we, we propose, which are uh, the security enforcement and the VXpress and the VXpress DRAM, which is correction on the on the VXpress implementation in Gem5, to have more than two gigabyte being uh, visible to Opti. Also, you have we we have to to create the Opti tool chain, right? To build it to, to fit Gem5 functionalities. So it, so we had to set up a boot form, create or fuse different elements of uh, OptiGem5 and Linux and uh, of and uh, Gem5 Linux and OptiGem and Opti Linux to have both functionalities. And it creates a TMX and we end it's the TMX file and debug tools to to create a TI application. So I already shared when I when I did my first commit uh, this demo this demo on GitHub of OptiGem5. With this kind of with the ability of running uh, OptiGem5, you we can. Develop new develop secure bootform for new platform using Gem5 to model this new platform. Implement new secure device to and test it and test the driver for said secure device in Opti. Implement hardware counter measure at the cache level or this kind of law. and of, and uh, finally testing security in OTE. So oh we are using Gem5 for for testing and with with the Opti. So first. These are the we are the key point we like in in Gem5 in SCFS mode for security. But to do secure rest thing, we are forced to use on uh, uh, full system mode because we because besides the possibility to to do, do will to use a real bootstrap and use a secure rest, kernel effect and kernel effect are really an important. Uh, side effect on our attacks, and we need to have this effect taken in, in, into account. These are also uh, the, 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 the pro and cons of QMU and, we, and a real platform. The real issue with the real platform is that we don't have the information we want to have to, to study attack efficiently. This is an example attack you can set up on. We said we set up on, on using uh, using Opti. It's a labeling attack that we use. We, we that we use or full access to uh, secure OSs and uh, and kernel OSs to label traces of cache traces, and then we can use machine learning to request rebuild these labels on traces that aren't labeled and could be generated from a real platform. And with that, we had in doing this kind of attack, we had been, we see how the GDB was in, in incorporated was, yeah, was incorporated inside Gem5, and we see that we can do more things if we implemented a GDB monitor inside Gem5. So the GDB monitor is a is a really basic command that exists that exists in multiple uh, uh, SOC. It's a specific command that allow to to be uh, have a implementation dependent behavior. And for example, flash, ROM, or do something like that. But we propose a specific implementation of, of monitor command inside Gel5 that, that leaves the simulation with the content of the, of, the, of the command that is provided inside GDB as a message. This, this can allow user to react to, to have a specific config that will receive, will Upon reaching a certain breakpoint or a certain call, we see the message from 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 Gem5. And for example, we can after after receiving this message, call C6 method or other things to get information from the simul from, from uh, the simulation. And we can use this kind of this, this monitor, for example, for example, to dump cache, for example, sending uploading a specific CSX method inside caches to be able to dump the content of the cache. On breakpoint, which is really useful, flushing cache from GDB, which we can, for example, have with these two lines, we can set up attack only from GDB to have a real application and test it without running anything else on the system, just to test a theoretical attack against the application. We can switch to interactive mode inside the simulation, for example, having upon breakpoint doing something inside inside the the Python config on after a breakpoint. And we can also change debug flag from GDB, being able to activate debug flag only around some part of uh, of a workload without having having to interfere inside this workload and add environment section, for example. 
With other functions that we add, we can be even more precise on what uh, do we implement specific uh, behavior with GDP. An example, we, an example of this of the edge of monitor is creating what's called a victim scan, which is a simple program that is trying to to search for victim line dynamically when running an application to to to, to, to do some cache timing for the cache timing attack. In conclusion. Thanks to some of, of, um, of all the of work we can now boot up this, this work is already incorporated inside the, the, the M5 repo. So no, you can boot up T. But it's open new possibilities to help SOC development, to explore new endeavor in SOC security, and to debug attacks, at, at, debug attacks, attacks leveraging M5 possibilities and information, for example, for example uh, debug flag. And in future works is, and as future works, we are trying to demonstrate an attacks against an unmodified opti, an unmodified opti worm. Having this attack work both in Gen five in real world, the, you, the attack probably wouldn't be able to be set up easily on real world because we will lacking some information. So using the information from opti from Gen five, make the attack po possi not po possible not only theoretic, theoretically but physically. And finally. Having the attack working on, on, on real hardware, we can use Gem5 to build control measure and demonstrate the effectiveness of this control measure on Gem5. So if you have any, que any question about... Uh... Great, th thank you for that. Cheers, How is this? Any questions? <laughs> mm. um, so in one of the earlier slides, you talked about uh, trusted mm. DRAM. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if um, does that mean like you trust that DRAM is I mean is in your threat model DRAM is trusted or do you do something to make sure like what are uh, for the moment this DRAM is just trusted DRAM because it's called trusted DRAM it's a place in the VExpress that is where trusted DRAM is supposed to be so it's only uh, 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 just a name a naming and also in meeting speaking where there is a DRAM inside the model that the ARM uh, Implementation is making because it's making the express implementation. But we are trying. We have done a simple, uh, fix, a simple secure memory enforcement that add, add a secure flag to the simple memory me memory implementation. Just check that. Just check to uh, check, check that the packets that are uh, re accessing the the memory have been correctly labeled with the secure with the secure information. And uh, if and if it's a really simple implementation, it just to just allow to add a secure a secure a secure flag to mem simple memo to any simple memory that enforce this property and prevent uh, uh, and warn also the user if something try to access uh, the a simple a simple memory that is labeled secure. But for the moment, it's just uh, naming uh, naming. Any other questions? I really hate these giant columns. <laughs> hard to see people. Uh, okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so next, we have uh, David Shaw. Great. Um, ah, oh, sorry. Of course. Thank you. From uh, talking about using Gen 5 serverless yeah Great. so this mic is for the video oh, okay this mic is for the road okay so, so i need i see i need your board <laughs> okay I see. uh yeah first of all hello um yeah my name is david and today i want to present a framework uh, that enables microarchitecture research with gem5 and serverless and uh first of all two questions um what I want to answer before I go into the stuff is, first of all, what is serverless and why do we need such a framework? And, but let's go by step. Um, first of all, what is serverless? And um, to understand this, we'll need to have a little bit of overview about how we deploy complex services in the cloud. And traditionally, we build these, we package uh, our services together as uh, beefy virtual machine image. And the only way to replicate it was to create several instances of these uh, virtual machine images. 
Microservices improve this um, um, situation by splitting the applications into several modules, and now these different modules could be uh, scaled independently. Now, serverless is a radical different uh, cloud execution model. And what you have there is that uh, you have tiny little functions implement uh, and that run only on demand. And the key thing is that if there is no demand and there is no invocation, then um, the cloud customers don't need to pay for it. And um, the uh, interesting thing as well is that the scaling of the functions, uh, so the creating new instances and switching instances uh, off is completely done and automatically by, by the uh, cloud provider. And that makes it quite attractive and that is, uh, there is no surprise that uh, the adoption of this serverless is quite uh, skyrocketing at the moment. Okay, a few uh, basics about serverless. So the programming model of serverless is that as a collection of stateless functions. The functions are invoked uh, on demand via trigger events, and the functions are stateless, which facilitates this uh, on-demand scaling down to zero. And the payment model is what it makes so different that the develop uh, so the cloud customers only pay for the actual time when the processor is uh, uh, when the CPU is processing the function. And also for the cloud provider, it's uh, interesting because it enables them uh, a high density and resource utilization of their expensive hardware. Uh, the thing is that this clothes we had before, and um, also that has implication on the workload characteristics. And what we see in these characteristics is that they are quite different. So first of all, they have very short execution time, they have a small memory footprint, and their invocation frequency of invocation pattern is quite sporadic, ranging in seconds to minutes. And the thing is that serverless runs nowadays on CPUs designed for conventional workloads. And that this has implication on the efficiency of processing this function we found in a recent work I will present also next week. And what we found is that uh, the CPU is wasting a lot of cycles while processing these functions and there's a high demand for microarchitectural support of these new kind of workloads. And for adding this support, we have great tools like Gem5. So that's really good. The problem is that uh, Gem5 was designed or was targets conventional workloads. Um, and what it, me what it implies is that out of the box or in its reference setups, um, Gem5 does not support the um, serverless software stack. And also the common way how we test things in Gem5 is often to simplify it for this kind of workloads and may lead it may need uh, lead to incomplete and misleading simulation results. And to understand this, I want to um, describe this a little bit by looking uh, for, by comparing the conventional workloads with the serverless workloads. So what you can see here is what we typically have a run long running uh, application, and the problem here is that the long the long execution time. Um, so for a SPED benchmark, it's, it takes already ages to run it on the real hardware and you cannot do it in a uh, cyclical mode on a simul on Gem5. So what we do is we focus on that what really matters and we use things like SIM points, region of interest, and because this is a well-known and established problem, there is already quite good support in Gem5. Uh, However, for SAS, it looks completely different because here we have very short execution time. And the nice thing is that we can simulate it in full. The problem is if we look more precise, then we can see um, a significant part is 
spend in the system stacks. And that is often what we simplify um, in favor of uh, execution uh, of simulation time for these conventional workloads. So in its reference setup, uh, key layers of the system stacks are missing in Gem5. For example, things like containerization or virtualization, or also key layers in the communication stack are often not there. Um, okay, so we need to support the full system stack to simulate these serverless workloads. And to understand what we need to add, I let's look at the at the software stack. And here is the conventional st software stack. We have communication, we have some libraries and the hardware. In our case, the hardware is the simulator. For these uh, serverless workloads, it looks the same as that there is, we have our user code, there's the function, some dependent libraries. Um, and now we, in order to communicate with uh, communication framework, for example, our RPC server. So a client can connect to the function, and this RPC server will invoke the, the function. And to ship the function, that is wrapped in a container. And in order to run a container, we need a container engine. And obviously, it is two first thing, the code and the libraries that is supported. But for the other two th layers, we have to do something. And um, the good news is that I did that for you, and that is um, uh, called, we called it vSwarm2. It's uh, a basically the serverless software stack that is compatible with Gen5, and it comprises, for example, a, a, con a kernel that is compatible with con to run containers on Gen5. And uh, also, we have this image. Um, where all the container engine and also uh, several packages are already pre-installed and uh, resources are available. And as a bonus, we also have a, a benchmark suite for serverless um, uh, and um, it's called WeSwarm. And here we have 20 um, functions that are ready to use with this software stack. And so you don't need to uh, write your functions. You just can take the benchmarks from vSwarm and then run it with vSwarm U on Gem5. OK. Um, the problem is that that was not everything. That would be too easy. Um, to understand the second main challenge, we need to go back and look at what we actually simulate. And um, for the conventional workloads, we uh, it's usually sufficient to model the core components in full detail because most of the uh, execution time is spent in these core modules. And also these long execution time often uh, eliminate side effects from a simplified test set up, setup. And it makes no sense to set everything up, all the complexity, because so many things can, broke, uh, can break. And uh, therefore, and also, it has ne negligible impact. However, for these serverless workloads, we have, again, these short execution times. And we need to look at the full picture. And if we look at the full picture, then we can see that our function is usually running on the server node. And, but the functions are invoked on a, with a client running on a completely different node. And um, because a significant portion of the execution time is spent in this communication, it would, it's not, uh, we cannot just simply ignore these uh, other components. Um, so we need to have a more representative test setup uh, and a more sophisticated test setup to um, um, have a better understanding. And um, the requirements for such a test set, uh, test, test infrastructure, I will just describe now. So before, the, before we can do our measurements, we need, of course, we need to boot the machine. And then we have to start the container, the function. Then we have to deal with some functional warming, because uh, often these serverless software 
um, the, the, so, uh, the serverless functions are implemented with uh, uh, languages like Node.js and they have a JIT engine and we need to uh, warm the JIT engine. And afterwards, we can do our um, um, simulations of the serverless functions. Um, the problem is this booting and starting container that takes a lot of time if you run it in detailed mode. So what we do is we use the mechanism of switching CPUs. It was already described in this morning. Um, and what we do is we accelerate this booting process with the KVM core and then uh, switch to a detailed core to do the uh, simulations. And of course, you can also use Gem5 checkpoints to uh, uh, snapshot the point after booting, and then you can science-based exploration with different parameters um, in the detailed evaluation. And uh, yeah, you can use the M5 binary to control this process because to identify where uh, where you take checkpoints, where you switch your CPUs, and all the things. Okay, and now during the measurements, um, often what we want is we want to simulate several invocations with, for example, different inputs. Um, but um, because these functions are so short, we need more precise trigger points. And to um, find out where we can set these trigger points, uh, I will just show the uh, normal communication. So it's just very normal, uh, the client sends a request, the function processing, process these requests and send a response. So now we can set, we can set trigger points at two, po uh, at two parts, uh, at two points. And the one is on the client side. And um, what we did is for, what we did for you was to um, use the M5 op magic instructions and instrument the Go client. And we send now a work begin item just before this, uh, we send the request. And we also send a work end, uh, a work end. Um, I, um, or we execute a work end magic instruction once we receive the response. Um, yeah, there is a client side and we also instrumented the uh, server side. And for this, we hooked up a function event on the onto the Linux scheduler, and then we compiled the thread info into the kernel. And with that, we can, can get the previous and the next PID. And now we can react on certain uh, scheduling events. For example, we can notify a pro when we switch from idle to active, or exit the simulation loop with a certain message. And yeah, with this, um, this is, everything integrated, the server side, I have to say, that is not yet there, but I will add it soon. Um, but uh, yeah, the, everything, all the test setup is you can find in WeSwarm U. And um, yeah, we, but I have already uh, implemented quite, uh, quite a lot of things. So uh, I, we have these containerized workloads we can use these uh, 20 ready to use uh, standalone kernels from vSwarm. And uh, we have the test infrastructure to do, um, which is more representative than the baseline, what we have in Gem5. Um, we have two cores and uh, uh, we have one machine setups and two uh, machine setups with several cores. And uh, as I said, yeah, the trigger points are uh, their server side will come soon. Um, this tool is actively used for our research. <clears throat> and of course, uh, we plan a lot more to do. For example, we want to add also Knative, which is uh, the uh, container orchestrator for um, auto scaling uh, in, in serverless. Uh, we want to also distribute, maybe uh, we also support distributed. Um, workloads where we have different functions on different nodes and they communicate with, with each other. You, know, you hope that we can uh, support the ARM instruction set soon. And um, also what is one point is virtualization because often also these serverless workloads are virtualized and we hope that we can also 
support this soon. Lot to do, and uh, yeah, I'm happy if uh, someone uh, are want to contribute to this and just reach out to me or to uh, the thing. At the moment, I'm working alone on it, so uh, would be nice if someone is interested. And to uh, summarize the takeaways, um, so what I just presented is that the solar workloads are, represent new challenges for modern CPUs, and there's an urgent need for, to do more research in this. And the problem is we have great tools, but the thing is that uh, also these new kind of workloads uh, challenge these um, uh, tools, and we have to do a little bit more. Um, and what I presented is uh, VSwarmU, and that's a framework to do this microarchitecture uh, research for serverless. And uh, what you can do with VSwarm is you can run containerized workloads with Gem5. And we also have the, it also includes the test infrastructure to do the detailed evaluation. And with that, I want to say thank you and happy to answer any questions. Um, so yeah, uh, so so the question was if we uh, also capture the network interface. Yeah, um, so it is a good question. So the uh, Gem Gem Five has a network model, uh, the Ethernet model, and we model every, uh, that. So we uh, connect with these Ethernet models, the two um, the two systems, and so we can communicate from the client node via this uh, Ethernet models uh, with the server node. And so we uh, simulate everything. Yeah. More questions? I have a quick question. Yeah. Are you interested in making the vSwarm stuff a resource so people can just download it and use it? To be honest, I today I got a lot more, uh, a lot of interesting ideas. And uh, that sounds really uh, Yes. Like a really cool idea, and that would be cool. Yes, we'd love to have it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hope we can uh, work more closely together. Yeah, I got a lot of new ideas today. Nice. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks. Okay, so next up, <clears throat> uh, we were supposed to have Charles Jamison talk about the Gem Five GPU accuracy profile. Profiler. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it, so we had a backup speaker. But unfortunately, he couldn't make it either. <laughs> so instead, if you're interested to learn about the Gem5 GPU Accuracy Profiler, or GAP, um, which does some validation of Gem5's GPU model, there is a video on YouTube on the Gem5 YouTube channel. Also, please subscribe. OK, so <laughs> moving on to the next speaker then, uh, we have Mary Ambabe from uh, UC Davis, and she's gonna talk about her work, um, her recent work trying to create a cycle level unified DRAM cache controller model in Gem5. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Marianne Bobby. As Jason said, uh, I work at the Dark Air Research Group, Swiss department at UC Davis. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a part of my research where uh, me, Ayaz, and Jason have developed a cycle level unified DRAM cache control model for Gem5. Okay. Yeah.
Um, so let's quickly see uh, what has been our motivation to develop such a tool. Um, so Harbor managed DRAM caches are already in the market. Uh, one of the first generations um, that had in, um, DRAM cache uh, in their product was Intel's Knights Landing. And the next generation was Cascade Lake, where uh, a DR4 was a cache for NVRAM. And the next generation is going to be Sapphire Rapids, where an HVM2 is going to be a cache for a DDR5 memory. So the good thing about how we manage DRAM caches are that they are transparent to the programmers. They're easier to use for uh, data movement instead of doing it manually. So in general, they make um, programming of heterogeneous memory systems much more easier. In terms of research, there have been a very large body of research works um, around the idea of DRAM caches, but most of them mostly are focusing on how to improve the performance of DRAM caches. Uh, for example, in terms of um, caching granularity or tag management or replacement policy. And we believe that uh, the market architecture of the cache and the main memory interfaces or their memory controllers can lead to unexpected performance pathologies that hasn't been captured properly and accurately in the, re in the previous research works. One example is reported by Hillebrand and his colleagues where they have analyzed the real hardware of Cascade Lake. And they said that, uh, for example, in case of a write miss, it can lead to up to five memory accesses. Uh, so this type of behavior and access amplifications, we believe that can affect um, dramatically the performance that we can get from the DRAM caches. As a result, we decided to develop this tool, which is basically a, sorry, which is basically um, a detailed simulation model for DRAM cache inspired by the, or modeling the Intel's Cascade Lake where a DDR4, um, sorry, a DDR4 is a, a, a DRAM cache backed up by an NDRAM. Um, can I stop and present again? Okay. Sorry. For that. It was not helpful for this presentation. <laughs> okay. So we called our model a unified DRAM cache controller, briefly UDCC, and it models Intel's Cascade Lake in 2LM or cache mode. Um, in the picture uh, on the bottom, we have our unified DRAM cache controller where it's connected to CPU or LLC to receive the read or write access request. And it has consisted of three main buffers. The major one is outstanding request buffer where all of the read and write requests are going to be maintained there until they are fully processed into the DRAM cache or the NVRAM. And it has a conflicting request buffer uh, to make sure that the functionality is kept um, correctly in case we have conflicting addresses based on the um, cache line addresses, we make them serialized. And it also has an NV NVRAM write buffers, which takes care of all the uh, write backs dirty lines upon their eviction. And this unified DRAM cache controller through a shared bus is connected to a DRAM interface and NVRAM interface. Both of them are single channel. And in terms of the cache architecture, DRAM is supposed to be a direct map cache, tag and metadata, or a sort alongside the data within the same cache line. It's an insert on mess type of cache, and the write backs are, um, uh, the dirty lines are going to be written back to the NVRAM upon their eviction. Um, in order to validate our model, we have performed two types of validation. The first one is a performance validation, where, um, as the first step, we configure UDCC with a DDR4 cache with a buffer size of 256. We fed this UDCC with an access pattern uh, where all of the accesses were reads and they were supposed to, to be all hits in the DRAM cache. And we observed the bandwidth that we can get at the LLC uh, or observed by the LLC from this DRAM cache. So because it's only a simple read accesses, we expected that to achieve a bandwidth very close to the peak bounded 
that is expected from the DDR4, which is around 19 gigabytes per second, and also very close to the performance of Gen 5 default memory controller. As shown on the left side, we can see the observed bandwidth from UDCC is uh, very close to the peak bandwidth as well as the uh, default memory controller of Gen 5. The next thing that we did was to compare the access amplification of our model to the numbers that were reported um, by the Hillebrand and his colleagues in their paper for the real hardware of um, Cascade Lake. Uh, so we analyzed uh, each case of read-only or write-only, 100% hit or 100% miss cases. As it's been, uh, and as it's been shown uh, on the right side, we can see that for the first three cases, we almost are very close to the actual reported numbers. Uh, the only difference is for write misses. And the reason for that is that in the Cascade Lake, uh, when there is a write miss, it first fetches that line from the back in the server, NVRAM, writes that line to the DRAM cache, and then it writes the actual data on top of that. In our model, we decided to uh, merge these two writes together. As a result, we have one less access amplification for write misses. We also have checked the functionality correctness of our model. Uh, for this purpose, we used Gen 5 full system simulation. We were able to successfully uh, boot Linux kernel on a system where it had um, UDCC as a memory controller. And we also have run, uh, have run uh, GAPBS as well as NAS parallel benchmark suites. Uh, because we have limited time, I'm not going through the, um, the analysis of the results for these cases. In the next slides, we are going through a couple of case studies that we've done uh, on our model. And the methodology that we, we use to run these experiments is as follows. So we use Gen 5's traffic generator, where it enables us to have linear or random uh, traffic patterns. We can control the combination of read or writes uh, for the given uh, access pattern. We can be read only or write only. And we can control the mids or hit ratios based on the size that we can decide for the DRAM cache versus the range of addresses that we are going to generate using the uh, traffic generator. And we also use Gen 5's memory interfaces, DDR3, 4, 5, and also NVM. And unless uh, the case study itself doesn't specify the buffer size, we have assumed that it's 256 entries. And the block size is always 64 bytes. Um, so for the first case study, uh, we were trying to use different memory technologies, different DDRs as the cache, and we wanted to see what's the uh, minimum amount of buffer size that we require to fully utilize that memory, that memory technology as a DRAM cache in our system. So we had this idea that, uh, for example, for the memory technologies that give higher bandwidth, they probably need more buffer entries to reach to the peak bandwidth. And we wanted to see if, whether that's the case or not and what happens for different types of traffic patterns. So we configured UDCC with DDR3, 4, 5, and we fed that with different access, uh, access patterns, read only all miss cases or write only all miss cases, and also read only and write only for all hit cases as well. So we changed the amount of buffer in the UDCC until we reached to a peak bandwidth, which means that by adding more buffers, we're not going to gain much uh, performance improvement after that buffer size. That amount of buffer for each case is reported on the right side, and the observed peak bandwidth at the LSC is reported on the left side. So the observation was that, um, yes, buffer size can become large, but not impractical. But uh, for example, in case of DDR5, it can be as long uh, as as large as a hundred, uh, a thousand, sorry, a thousand, a number of uh, entries. But this is only more visible for DDR5, for DDR3 and 4. It's like you know, the buffer size is not like a um, uh, controlling factor for the bandwidth. But the interesting observation was that the buffer size to achieve to the peak bandwidth totally depends on the memory. Uh, traffic instead of the technology itself. For example, we consider the red bars, which is for write only miss cases. We can see all of the memory technologies have almost the same performance, and it's very poor compared to other cases. And that performance or that bandwidth has been achieved by a very few number of uh, buffer entries. 
Um, the next case, case study was about NVM um, brightware leveling technique. So we were like, so we have NVRAM in our system and we know that NVM has a limited right entrance. So in order to overcome that, they use a technique which is called wear leveling in which for every 14,000 writes that happens within the same region, uh, NVRAM takes 60 microseconds to totally move that, uh, that region to another region which hasn't been written as much. Uh, so in this way, they try to make the amount of writes within different regions of NVRAM unified. So we turned that on in our system and wanted to compare um, the bandwidth that, or the performance that we can gain from the DRAM cache in each case. So we fed UDCC with an access pattern which all of them were right, were supposed to miss on the DRAM cache completely, and all of them were generating 30 lines in the DRAM cache. Um, so for the case where we didn't have wear leveling, the observed bandwidth at the LSD from the DRAM cache was 1.92 gigabyte per second. Once we turned on wear leveling, it dropped to 1.77 gigabyte per second. So it, this means that uh, we have 8.5 per percent performance degradation once we have wear leveling turned on in our system. And for something that happens every uh, every 14,000 writes for 60 seconds, this is a huge performance cost that we need to give if we have NVRAM as a backing store in our system. Um, the last case study that we're going to see in this presentation is what's the effect of um, performance of the backing store or NVRAM in this case on the uh, performance or the benefit that we can get from NVRAM cache. So, for this purpose, we played with the timing parameters of NV, uh, NVM model in Java 5 to make it twice as fast or half as slow compared to the baseline. And then we tried read-only and write-only cases where all of them were missing. Obviously, if we want to engage NV, NVM, we need missed cases. And then we observed the bandwidth for, uh, in each case uh, for baseline uh, fast and slow. Uh, for these access patterns and the bandages reported on this figure. So the main takeaway here was that once an access pattern requires more interaction with the NVM, the impact of NVM performance on the DRAM cache is, is becoming bigger and more impactful. So for example, if we write only all missed cases, we can see that once NVM is twice faster, we can get almost two times more bandwidth when it's uh, compared to the baseline. When it's uh, half as slow, we can get almost half of the, the bandwidth that we, we were able to gain from the uh, baseline case. Um, as a future work, uh, so we are working on this model to make it more modular. So the first thing that we have considered is that uh, we want to make these interfaces pluggable. So by doing that, we can abstract away the timing and microarchitectural limitations of these memory technologies and just focus on, uh, on the architecture of the DRAM cache or the backend store. And it also enables us to study accurately the different combinations of memory technologies as the cache or backing store. Um, the other thing that we are interested in studying is to have some control over the links or ports. Um, so for example, to model CXO, like what happens when we have um, a DRAM cache which is connected to the backing store for a CXO. So we are working on this, um, on these steps uh, for our future work. Um, as a summary, so in this presentation, we saw that UDCC is a DRAM cache extension for Gen5, which models Intel's Cascade Lake into LM mode. Um, having these type of tools, it will help uh, to make the research on heterogeneous memory uh, systems where they contain DRAM caches easier. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is that um, we are working on the improvement of our current version of the code. So it's available on a private repo. Uh, it will be included in the future uh, releases of Gen 5. But if you want to take a look at it or use it, just let us know. We'll be happy to share the, uh, the repo with you. Um, thank you so much. If you have any questions. Questions?
Um, it's not implemented in a slick, so I think it's the latter. The answer is the latter. Is there any so, yeah, so we are working towards the future steps where we are interested to make like each request responsible for its policy that it's taking uh, in the DRM cache. So one of the things that we considered was to redesign everything and use a slate to implement that. But for now, for this current version of the tool, we're not using a slate. Any other questions? Great, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mayar Salani, also from UC Davis. Um, and he's going to be talking about his work in validating Gem 5's memory components. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mayar. Uh, I'm a PhD student uh, of computer science at UC Davis and I'm here to present our work on evaluating Gem 5's memory components. So, we all know that uh, simulation is a common and important tool in computer architecture research. We also know that errors in computer uh, in simulators, if they are sufficiently large, could mislead us, the researchers. So it is very clear to us that simulator results need to be evaluated and validated. So what I'm going to do here is to present what I think would be a methodology uh, for va validating memory components in Gem5 simulator. Okay, so let's first look at where errors come from. Overall, there are three common types of errors. The first type is modeling errors, uh, which arise from modeling the functionality of a model Incorrectly. For example, you could imagine someone could uh, model the memory, uh, but that memory would deliver incorrect values for accesses or deliver zeros. The second type of errors are specification errors that are basically caused by giving wrong information to the person implementing that model. For example, if I gave uh, wrong values for the timing parameters of a DRAM model to the person who was modeling the DRAM models in Jeff it would have caused this specification error. The last type of errors uh, are abstraction errors that are basically caused by abstracting away some of the models uh, because of design decisions and not accounting for the timing effect effects of those. Or basically deciding to implement, uh, not implement some features or implement them in a much simpler way uh, to gain performance or make the design easier. So how do, we, how do we people actually validate things? Um, one way of validating thing is code or simulators is manual inspection. We can all sit around a, a computer escape, a screen and go over the code and uh, validate that the code is doing what it's supposed to do. But looking at the code base for Gem 5, it is very long and it's very complex. Uh, it is not possible for us to do that. Uh, also, uh, us as humans are not validated, so we could also make errors. Another thing, uh, another method uh, would be to compare against some trusted reference. Uh, cycle accurate simulators do this by comparing against real hardware uh, or formal verification researchers verify programs by like, analytical methods. So what about Gem 5 makes it hard to validate? <clears throat> First of all, Gem 5 code base is complex uh, and it is huge. So it is hard to manually inspect and verify the code. Gem, 5's, Gem 5 is also not cycle accurate. 
Uh, so you don't have information for every cycle. And so it's not really appropriate to take the approach of cycle accurate simulators. And another thing that we have to note is that Gen5 models are very diverse. So whatever methodology we think of should be general enough to capture the design specifications of diverse models. Uh, for example, Gen5 has CPU models, DRAM models, cache models. So what do we think we should do with Gen5? Um, what is this methodology I'm talking about? So I, I, we think that we need to use a bottom-up approach. This allows us to validate more complicated models um, or systems and subsystems using validated uh, simpler models. For example, you can use a validated DRAM model and a validated cache model to build a validated um, memory, uh, memory subsystem. Or you could, and then you can take that memory subsystem to build a valid full system. Next, we think that you should be able to isolate the component under the test so that you can localize the errors and only look at the errors caused by that component. And also, when it comes to Gem5, in order for us to test the memory subsystem, we have to drive that memory subsystem with something. And we know that the CPU models in Gem5 are not accurate. So fortunately for us, uh, Gen5 provides us for, with tools that provide defined behavior, uh, namely PyTrafficGen that both Ayaz and Mariam talked about, uh, GhostGen, which uh, as a part of this project I implemented and is, has been merged to Gen5 codebase and simple memory that gives you deterministic latency and bandwidth uh, measurements. And lastly, <clears throat> for each component, uh, we need to come up with a trusted reference. This trusted reference could be anything from a simulator, a mathematical equation, or a benchmark. Uh, specifically for this project, we use DRAM Sim3 as a trusted reference uh, because it has been, uh, it's a cycle accurate simulator and it has been validated against my, Micron's very log bench. So uh, let's look at DRAM models. Um, I want to preface this by saying that when I uh, talk about HBM, uh, for uh, all of you who were here uh, before the coffee break, uh, this HBM is not the HBM model that Ayaz talked about. This is before Ayaz. Um, so we focused on DDR3, DDR4, and HBM. Gen5 allows you to configure different models, and um, the two parameters that we chose to configure were address mapping and paging policy. As a reference, as I said, we use DRAM Sim3, and the tool that will give us that defined behavior here is high traffic gen. And we use bandwidth and average latency for comparison between DRAM Sim3 and Gen5. So let's look at bandwidth results. So as you can see, DDR4 and DDR3 give us uh, similar results under both linear and random traffic, which are so, uh, both the worst and best cases of our experiments. You can see that HPM shows this very significant difference between uh, Gen5 and DRAM Sim3, and we're not going to talk about that. When it comes to latency, however, there is noticeable difference between Gen5 and DRAM Sim3. After inspecting the code a little bit, uh, I realized that uh, the queuing structure in the Gen5 memory controller is, uh, is different from uh, that of DRAM Sim3, where in DRAM Sim3, each rank in each channel has its own queue, but uh, in Gen5, there is uh, one shared queue between uh, all of the ranks. Uh, this, uh, I think, is one ex good example of an abstraction error, where uh, because of simplicity, Gen5 has decided to use only one queue uh, for the memory controller. Next up are caches. Uh, so this is a little bit more complicated experiment. Uh, just um, So the model uh, or the component under test is a cache hierarchy uh, configured using Ruby caches in Gen5. Uh, it's a two-level cache hierarchy with the messy protocol. Um, and as a reference, we're going to use the mathematical equation uh, for average memory access time. Basically, we're going to look at the functionality of caches, which is to hide latency and see if they are if it, if the caches in Gen5 are doing that. So to configure every experiment, uh, we're, we're changing the working set size. 
And what is working set size in the experiment? It is the number of bytes that are accessed by the Pi traffic gen. Basically, uh, for each experiment, we're going to prime the caches by bringing the first 512 uh, kilobytes of memory into the caches, and then we're, uh, we're going to ask the Pi traffic gen to access from address 0 to some variable address. We're going to uh, report the average read latency as AM, AMAT. So again, the tools that are uh, providing us with defined behavior here are Pi traffic gen and simple memory. And, uh, and the metric here would be average latency. Uh, in this table, you can see the specifications that I used to configure my two-level uh, cache hierarchy. And I want to just note that the L2 cache is inclusive of L1. And this is the system diagram for that system. Uh, you can see that the only th uh, thing that does not or yet have a defined behavior is the cache hierarchy. And as you can see here, uh, and if you can trust my mathematics, uh, I solved this, uh, the average memory access time. For this configuration, basically, uh, the numbers you can see here, 64 kilobytes uh, and 512 kilobytes are the, the sizes of our caches. And alpha and beta are basically constants this, uh, that you can solve for uh, using the sizes of uh, your L1 and L2 cache. And uh, looking at the equation and the uh, graph here, the graph uh, shows the function that would be implemented using those equations. So, the, so we can verify that the caches uh, implement functional, fu uh, functionality correctly. So let's see if we can put uh, two verified models together and build a, another verified component, which is more complicated. So what I did here was to take that messy two level cache, configure it to be as much as possible like to Intel Skylake caches. And I used the dual channel DDR4 as the backing DRAM. To test this uh, system, I used GUPSGen, which I implemented uh, using a specification on HPCC random access benchmark as a synthetic traffic generator in GEMFAT. The metric here would be giga updates per second. Basically, what HPCC random accesses is a key store uh, value, uh, key value store application where uh, the, you read a value, you update that value, you write it back. So in this table, uh, I show uh, the specifications of the caches both in Intel Skylake and Gen5 model. And at the last row, you can see the GUPS measurement for both Intel Skylake and the Gen5 model. And you can see that they are uh, within 10% of each other. So overall, uh, we presented a methodology for uh, of the three DRAM models that we looked at. HBM showed a significant difference between Gen5 and DRAM SIM3. And I think the main takeaway of this presentation would be that for every component, uh, that we define a trusted reference that captures the purpose that the model was designed for. For example, if you were to cycle, uh, validate Gen5 um, cycle, accu cycle accurately, it would not be feas feasible and probably not the right way to do it. Thank you for listening to me. I'm open to, ask, to answering your questions. Thanks. Questions? When you are preparing the memory and the, the VM performance, are you also trying to emulate some side effect of the memory, like whatever like attacks or something like that? Oh, no. no. We were just focusing on the like, read and read bandwidth and latency. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, or is that, is that worth the time for the CPU stuff? I, um, well, I'm going to answer this. So Jason is here. He would be the first person to, best person to answer this question. But personally, if you ask my opinion, I, I would not 
I don't think it would be the right way to model anything in Gen5 because Gen5 probably is used for simulating many, many cycles. Uh, and cycle accurate simulation takes a lot of time. Uh, so the goal of this presentation was hopefully to present an idea of how to get the best of both worlds. You know, you know we want a not cycle accurate model that gives us uh, accurate enough information. Yes. A quick answer is we can integrate with DRAM some three. So no need for us to try it around. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, great. Thanks, Mayor. OK, so next up, we have uh, Stefan Spencer. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, design space exploration for custom hardware designs in Gen 5 song. Oh, okay, uh, yes. This is for the camera, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Just extend this. Spacebar, does it work? Yes. All right, so cool. Spacebar works. Let's go. So I'm Josh Flakord. Uh, this is this, but we'll get there. <laughs> so we're going to introduce uh, design space exploration for custom hardware accelerator designs at Gym 5 Salon. Uh, so we're from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. I'm going to pass it over to Zeph to kind of do our introduction. Perfect. So I'm going to go over a brief outline. Um, first, we're going to go over the design challenges for pre-RTL simulators and the motivation behind Salam. Then we're going to go over Gem 5 Salam's main lo system level components. Um, these are LLVM interface, which wraps the LLVM API into Salam. COM interface, which wraps Gem 5 into Salam. The hardware interface for virtual hardware setup and initialization. And Salam, which brings all of these things together. We're then going to talk about some of the features that Gem 5 Salon, uh, in Gem 5 Salon that we'd like to highlight, such as a configurator for mini accelerator systems, complex accelerator modeling, data-driven accelerator execution, the extensibility of Salon's uh, API, and the available metrics that can be gathered from our simulation. So one of the main things that we were looking for when we were writing Gem 5 Salon is we weren't necessarily looking to expand Gem 5, but instead create a full tool set API to use alongside Gem 5 for hardware accelerator modeling. So some of the, that was some of the design, the main factors in our motivation for the creation. Uh, so the one thing we did is we basically decided to take all of the tools that are basically already, all the sim objects that are predefined for Gem 5, and we have now made it so we can reuse all of those objects, but for modeling complex systems of accelerators. Uh, we do this by actually utilizing LLVM virtual IR and actually run that directly as our data path inside of Gen 5 Salam. Uh, this allows us to basically model complex architectures, which we actually are easily configurable using some of our configurator, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and it also allows us to have kind of the, the benefits of a software simulator with the diagnostics that you would get for hardware simulation, all while being pre-RTF without having to do any actual any, any Verilog, any VHDL, this is straight from source application to simulator. And benchmarks are usually written in C or C++. So the first main aspect is our LLVM overface. So <laughs> interface, excuse me. <laughs> uh, this, so this generate, takes in the generated IR from LLVM. Uh, we do a static collaboration. So we go through, we take the IR, we break it into basic blocks. We define all the interdependencies. Uh, 
And this is kind of our central interface for use within Salam. The next thing, main component is the communications interface or the common interface. So this is where we borrow most of the elements from Gem5. Uh, so we have our own internal memory controller, which is hooked to a top level controller tied to our, our interface, our accelerator cluster, and then back to the Gem5 ecosystem. Uh, so what this allows us to do is we can basically define any, any memory elements and their interconnectivity. And we actually have a pretty large list that we've already predefined. So you can actually just hook up just by designating locations, which we'll go over later in the configurator. Uh, with, you know, isolated to the cluster level, to the accelerator level, locally within the accelerator, and then for the full ecosystem of Gem5 and the accelerator COSIM. The very last aspect is the hardware interface. So we also virtualize the hardware that would be running the accelerator cluster. Uh, to do this, so we've, this is kind of the third iteration of this tool. So we've learned going through that the main aspect we wanted to focus on now was simplicity and ease of use. Uh, so at this point, all of our hardware, all of our functional units, even our instructions, everything can be defined externally in a YAML file. As long as you just, out, so you, and you can have profiles saved per application, even at an individual function level inside of an application, where you can have a hardware model, and we actually validate the hardware model that we took using a standard 40 nanometer set and FPGA, and actually create it to be accurate inside of Gem5 Salam. Uh, and this applies over the LLVM interface, the common interface, to do a full cycle. We actually execute every instruction through its entirety to perform the actual computation that is in the source code. Uh, with a co-simulation alongside Jim Fopsalon. And that's kind of where we bring it all together. So kind of the, the benefits is because we do every cycle, we, you know, every instruction is actually read, executed, every memory operation is sent and performed. We actually have dynamic execution parallelism. We can do dynamic dependency controls. We have dynamic power and performance metrics. We also have, uh, that also lets us get metrics on the hardware usage. So you can actually see the occupancy, the tracking, everything at a cycle level through the entire execution is all parameters that you can get at, at the output for Gem5 Slum. And then Zeph's gonna go back more over the configurator. So before we start talking about the configurator, we first sort of need to talk about the motivation behind having it. While we were working on Salam, we wanted to showcase the flexibility of the system by implementing something larger than our single function examples. So our single function examples were like Jim or vector add. With this in mind, we decided to implement a full scale mobile net v2 accelerator design inside of Gem5 Salam as shown in this figure. Breaking out the network into a head, body and tail um, these are individual accelerator clusters. Um, so while Salon was capable of actually simulating the system at the time, uh, maintaining, developing, and iterating on that design became kind of impossible once we hit like 150 memory map devices and we had to maintain the Gem5 configuration file and we also had to maintain our own memory map for that. So this sort of brings us to the Salam configurator. The Salam configurator was purpose built for enabling large scale systems to easily be explored by using the design flow shown at the top of the slide. First, you start with a system description that takes the form of a YAML file, a uh, similar in structure to the one shown at the bottom of the figure. Um, here you can see that we define the accelerator cluster and you can define multiple accelerator clusters, just this is a simple example. Um, and any extra devices inside of it, such as DMAs, accelerators, scratch pad memories, uh, or actually I should really say memory devices, so stream buffers and all of that that we have as well. Um, you then invoke the Salam's conf Salam configurator and it generates a full Gem5 system configuration file and the relevant C headers that contain your generated memory map. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about a different feature of Gem5 Salam, which is complex accelerator modeling. As mentioned before, with our runtime engine, we're able to dynamically allocate data path elements based on the structure of the LLVM IR that's fed to it. What this allows us to do is to model individual function calls as separate data paths that share a COM interface. And since it shares a COM interface, it shares the same memory resources that it's hooked up to. So in this example on the right, 
uh, it shows a merge sort accelerator where with initial with the initial function call, uh, in this case, is array management. So that's our top level accelerator. Inside, well, it's our top level function. Um, and that becomes the top level, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, that invokes the merge sort logic as needed during runtime. So it would do the array management, so moving from temp to the sorted array, and then it would invoke the merge sort logic again. Building on our ability to execute multiple data paths per accelerator, we have also recently added support for data-driven accelerators that are able to dynamically execute different data paths based on available data. We implemented this by adding status registers to all of our streaming memory devices, allowing for accelerators to monitor the availability of data dynamically. In this figure, we, we take our merge sort example and expand it. In this, um, there are three total accelerators in the system where accelerators A and B request a sorted array from a shared accelerator. The shared accelerator simply has to monitor if data is available on either stream and then begins execution of the merge sort logic. Josh is now going to talk about the extensibility of our system. So we should do those examples to just to provide a kind of a, a an example of Gem 5 Slime doesn't, it's not a, we are just an API. We are a tool chain for design space exploration. So that's, and that's kind of our, that was our focus. So kind of the main thing is the, with using LLVM API internally, and we actually have it fully integrated inside of the newest version of Gem 5 Slime. So you can actually do optimization passes using the LLVM. You can do compiler optimizations on your code and actually use LLVM's API to basically make modifications to your data path, pass that IR into the simulator. Then you can also easily add if you need a, with that same regard, if you wanted to add an intrinsic or a custom instruction, those things can be easily added to SLOM simply by defining just the standardized parameters in a boilerplate template. And then the only thing in the code that has to be changed is writing the function definition for the execute of that instruction as C++ code. Uh, otherwise, it should basically, as whenever you recompile add, it'll actually automatically generate all the C files, all the C++ files needed for Salam. It'll update its own internal model, and it should basically just be ready for any, anything that is defined in the end. Uh, this also basically allows you to swap basically hardware profiles. Uh, that's kind of part of the rapid testing. If you wanted to sweep a parameter, if someone else developed something, you could take their model and you would be able to, you should have the exact same precise every cycle, the exact same output from anything that has been created anywhere should be consistent across all uses of Salam. Uh, and really we basically just wanted to yeah, ease the user experience of doing ex exploration on any sort of accelerator, any sort of co-simulation. Uh, that's, that's kind of our thing is we have a whole system dedicated to kind of the whole, the system topology, the hardware topology, everything is just now definable with simply parameters. Just plug in your numbers and then hit go and it should run. Uh, and these are just some of the kind of the metrics that you can kind of get at the end of the runtime. So you do power area performance metrics. Uh, so this is what we've, this has been validated in some of our other papers. There's a lot of depth into this. Uh, since we do execute every instruction, every cycle, we have basically you know hooks at any point. So you can see the occupancy throughout the whole thing. You can see instruction uses. You can see functional unit usage. You can modify the availability of resources. You can watch how that affects the data path. Uh, we have you know complex system diagramming, and just you can also it technically generates traces because it runs everything through as it does it. And really, there's no limit to the output. It's more wherever you want to plug in, whatever parameter you're interested in. We hope that there is. Some, something in Salam that you could basically just easily say, I want to pull that number out and it's available. Uh, and it's still active, so we're still kind of active research. There's a couple of different groups working on it. Uh, and if anybody uh, is curious to look at more, check out their GitHub. You know, we are looking for kind of expansion. Anything you want to add, Zeph? I think that's it. Great. Yep, any questions? Uh, yes. What's for real why why I ANL file is is to generate directly uh the file or the or the documentation from all the 
So the the question is, why are we using YAML files for our simulator? No. Oh. But, but, so what could we could use the uh, YAML file to generate for solar? Uh, to, uh, to also generate Verilog. Uh, no, because this is all pre RTL. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that that's so that that's actually so that is literally the next active step that I, we're working on. Basically, is being able to take this and actually push that now into generating Verilog or potentially Chisel. Actually, is kind of where it may end up. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's yes, that's feasible, and that's kind of a direction that it's moving. Uh, yeah, well, it just yeah, it's just a time constraint. Yeah, it's coming up with the mapping for all of that is is probably the the, yeah, the biggest challenge. This is this uh, is four years in the making. Yeah, two, that's two, two of the so uh, we had a we have another. The main author, Sam Rogers, he he did a lot of work on this. He just got a job uh, at Arm Xilinx, or not Arm, AMD Xilinx, uh, and then Josh here just got a job as well. Yeah, so so yeah, I'm the only one left. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the challenge is time, really. Yes, but that's yeah, that's kind of the next active area as we're going into is yet yeah, actually trying to move towards generating that RTL now from this, allowing you to basically do early exploration and then immediately see that exploration into RTL for basically using some sort of machine learning to backfeed the results to actually revalidate the model internally to regenerate the RTL to essentially be able to try to generate hardware without ever having to actually design hardware. Exactly. All right, well, cool. Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Awesome. Next, we have um, Guyaraj uh, Saleswashwar from uh, Georgia Tech. We get another security talk. We'll be talking about uh, arm space and microarchitectural security and how Gem5 can help. So. Hello, can everybody hear me? Okay, um, thank you everyone for being here and uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. My name is Guru Raj, I'm a, a candidate, PhD candidate at Georgia Tech and today I'm gonna tell you about the arms race in microarchitectural security broadly and some takeaways that I've had from having that research in this space and how Gem5 can help, again, having worked with Gem5 through my PhD. So before telling you about the arms race and microarchitecture security, let me tell you why we need hardware security, right? Let's take a simple example with a safe that we use to protect valuables. Safe can be broken if its underlying material is vulnerable, right? For example, a safe cracker can simply move the dial of the safe and leak the combination of the safe by listening to the sound the safe's motion makes, right? And leak, get the secret combination. Or if the safe is brittle, they can simply take a hammer and break open the safe. In a very similar manner, systems are extremely vulnerable if the underlying hardware or microarchitecture has vulnerabilities. For example, today we are seeing many side channels, right? Side effects of execution of code on microarchitecture that can leak information. Classic examples are Spectre and Meltdown. Another example of attacks that damage the microarchitecture are fault injection attacks like row hammer attacks that threaten the integrity of data in our memories. We're seeing new and new attacks like these come up and today we are in the era of an arms race in the space of microarchitecture security. This arms race is actually playing out in two communities, computer architecture and computer security. If you simply look at past uh, top conferences in security like SNP, uh, Usenix Security, 
The number of hardware related papers or microarchitecture related papers as a fraction of the total papers is actually growing and it's seen an inflection point after 2018. So we're seeing this phase where attack papers are consistently exploiting microarchitectural vulnerabilities today. At the same time, of course, we know Moore's law is ending, processor performance is tanking, so it constrains the capabilities of hardware-based defenses. How much performance cost we can pay to get principal defenses? This is a challenge. So on one hand, we're seeing attacks that are increasing. On the other hand, principal defenses that cost a lot in terms of performance are hard to adopt. And what this means is that the, there's a perverse in, incentive to straddle this performance and security trade-off. And of course, we might end up with defenses that have corner cases where certain vulnerabilities might lie. So attacks are increasing, principal defenses are difficult. So we have new attacks that break existing defenses and this arms race continues. And we're seeing this arms race in several areas of microarchitecture. Classic example is the speculation-based attacks uh, like Meltdown and Spectre. They were discovered in 2018 and we had several microcode patches uh, OS patches that were recommended to lessen the um, vulnerability with these attacks. But 2019 and 2020 saw a new wave of attacks. For example, MDS attacks that created, exploited very similar vulnerabilities like Meltdown and worked despite the Meltdown patches. And then we saw more microcode patches like new instructions to clear out the buffers through which these MDS attacks leak data out. And of course, we saw new attacks that work despite these patches. For instance, in 2022, uh, Usenix, we're going to see a new paper that exploits new parts of the branch predictor that were not apparently patched in previous patches. And Intel recommends more OS patches and future CPUs might even be fixed against this. So we are seeing this arms race play out in commercial CPUs. Academic C defenses are no different. The first wave of defenses against speculation-based attacks like InvisiSpec, CleanUpSpec that try to make speculation invisible to memory system were shown to have certain corner cases where they can still leak information in some new attacks that came out uh, last year and this year. A second wave of defenses, STT, adopted a more principled approach where it blocked unsafe speculation and permitted certain safe speculation categories. But then a new defense in 2021 showed that there are certain corner cases again that SCT missed out that can leak information. So we're seeing this play out in academia as well. And well, we might think, well, speculation-based attacks are a you know, special uh, complex uh, application of attacks. Maybe it's hard to fix it. We're seeing this in every area of microarchitecture, actually. We saw uh, in the case of DRAM row hammer attacks, since 2015, the, the vulnerability was discovered, a defense was put in uh, DRAM, in commercial DRAM, and then in 2020, that defense got broken. We saw new defenses in academia, that defense got broken in 2021, and we are seeing new defenses come out in 2022, with which fix some of the previous uh, vulnerabilities. And my research has also contributed to some of these new defenses. We see, we've seen this play out in even cache side channel attacks where previous attacks break new defenses and, uh, sorry, previous defenses get broken by new attacks. And we've seen newer defenses patch those previous attacks. So taking a step back, bigger question to ask is, is this a dark reality that we just have to accept this arms race? Well, the takeaways uh, from this arms race so far for me are a few points. First, a hot take. Arms races are actually good for security. Why? Because, well, with each phase of this arms race, with each iteration, we actually improve the security of our systems. We realize the vulnerabilities in previous defenses and we actually patch them, right? The bad part of this is that, well, defenses get broken. And if some of these defenses are implemented in commercial hardware, catastrophic impact because fixing the hardware takes a really long time. And the ugly part is that these arms races are playing out over many, many years, right? 
So by the time a vulnerability is discovered, the defense has actually been implemented in hardware and the hardware has spent several years in the field. So what we really need is some ways to iterate over these defenses really fast so that we can end these arms races really fast before these um, defenses actually get implemented in hardware. So how can we as the GEM5 and security research community hasten the end of this arms race? Well, there are a few directions that I believe uh, can help. First, we really need defenses to be open sourced and the implementations to be available so that the community can actually inspect them and evaluate them. But unfortunately, I looked at the uh, last few years of uh, uh, security papers in computer architecture conferences and only a small fraction of, um, of papers actually have the defense implementations public. Only about 25% of the papers have the code open sourced. So that's a big challenge, right? Because without the implementations, it's really hard to argue what are the corner cases where a defense actually breaks down. You might argue that say, well, we face this problem while we evaluate performance, right? Just go ahead and implement that defense. The challenge is that performance is driven by common case, right? So if your implementation is approximate to the real work, it's still okay for performance. For, for security, the security is driven by the corner case. So if your implementation differs with the original implementation, even in several corner cases, you've actually ended up with a defense that has very different security properties than the original defense. So you really need the original implementation to be able to analyze its security effectively. The other challenge is that even the defenses that are open source are often in different simulators. And even if they are in the same simulator like Gem5, they're in different versions, right? So different versions are often not exactly compatible. So we need defenses to be available on common platforms. One way to do that is a firstly have the researchers open source their defenses and hopefully adopt a common standard like Gem5. Already in security uh, conferences, reviewers seem to realize the wide acceptance of Gem5 in the computer architecture community and they're asking for the, the, the folks publishing in those communities to implement their works in Gem5. So we as architects should also try to um, use Gem5 as much as possible. And of course, I'm preaching to the core here. Um, but the other thing that we need from the community is a push to actually mainline some of these defenses because then we get to have a slew of defenses in a common platform. And with each increasing version of Gem5, they will re be retained in that common platform, right? So hopefully going forward, we can do this better as a community. The second thing that we need to do is have better benchmarks and have better integration for these benchmarks. What do I mean by benchmarks? Well, in the world of performance, we know how spec benchmarks have revolutionized our orders of magnitude performance improvement. We've seen how MLperf improves performance, has driven improvements in performance in ML. But for security, we don't have a lot of benchmarks. And by benchmarks, I mean suites of attacks where we can validate our defenses against. Some examples already exist, certainly. For instance, Jason's uh, implementation of Spectre on Gem5 that was demoed on his website is very instructive, at least for me. And we have um, other benchmarks that have been developed by researchers, like for instance, the benchmark suite for evaluating cache attacks, published in ASPLOS a couple of years ago, that has helped improve understanding of cache attacks. But we need more kinds of benchmarks for different kinds of attacks, right? Row hammer attacks, speculation-based attacks, and so on, and a suite of these benchmarks. And also we need to integrate these benchmarks better with simulators like Gem5, so that not only can we test the security of new defenses, but also we can test new optimizations that are unrelated to the specific attack, but which actually exacerbate attacks or break defenses. 
this would help us as you know as we add optimizations to make sure that we don't break existing defenses and third a defense is only as secure as long as there are no adaptive attacks right sure we tested them against existing attack benchmarks but what if there's a new way that an attack can morph to break the security of the defense proving the security against adaptive attacks is extremely hard currently most papers in security con i mean architecture and security use properties or theorems or textual descriptions of the security against adaptive attacks to justify why these new attacks are not possible but we need better ways right i mean it's really not practical to be able to show security against all possible attacks with text right we need more automated ways of reasoning about these security properties and some of the works we are doing right now explore automatic automated generation of test cases against uh, gem5 implementations and tools to disprove security properties of existing gem5 implementations and what this can help is allow us to iterate over these defenses as we come up with them identify potential holes and make these defenses better before actually we go and publish it right and before these defenses can be implemented so basically these automated tools can close the gap between uh, the attack and defense faster and help us end this arms race faster so to summarize today we are in the era of arms races in microarchitecture security while this helps security we also need to reach the end of these arms races faster and to do that we need open source implementations better benchmarks and better automated testing mechanisms to reach the end faster and hopefully the gem5 community will be supportive if some of this interests you i am recruiting students for my research group starting fall 2023 if you're interested con contact me if you know someone who's interested send them my way thank you question Yes. That's a good question. So I don't think the determinism itself is a problem. What we need is to test our implementation over a large sort of body of executions, right? Um because it is often the corner case in the implementation that leads to a vulnerability. So activating that uh, corner case uh, of course takes a really large number of inputs a really large number of uh, executions and so we need to introduce non determinism in the inputs that we test our design on so that can hopefully allow us to activate these corner cases identify these security holes better so we can, and to be honest i think the determinism helps us debug because if you run the same test case differently uh, each time that's actually bad for us to understand what's happening inside it so yeah other questions yes i was curious you talked about automated testing it sounds like a good tool to find the problems but i mean even if all of that fast it's yep. not proof that the absolutely that, that's a very good point right um so i completely agree that proving something is secure against everything in the universe is extremely hard right and i don't think uh we're going to reach that stage for uh anything but very niche applications right where we are able to formally model the entire execution and you know so on and so forth so i think for the large uh body of uh uh implementations the only way to reason about security is going to be uh empirical right in this world where empirical security is our best bet rather than using 
manual analysis to try and come up with a corner case, uh, I think the better way forward is to enable tools that can actually automate this um, mechanism of generating test cases in the hope that we're able to find those corner cases. And if the best possible tools have not found some vulnerability, if the best minds have looked at something for an exceptionally long time and not found anything bad, hopefully it is secure, right? Uh, I, I guess that's the best uh, way forward that I see. Yes. I would argue that it's actually a good thing if a lot of people are trying to break something uh, because uh, what there are two worlds, right? One world where the good guys are trying to find vulnerabilities and improve the implementation and the other world where nothing is available, everything is obscured, but the bad guys actually have discovered something uh, vulnerable, right? So there's a common saying that security by obscurity is no security. So I think it's a better world to be in where we are open sourcing our implementations. And hopefully, uh, if there is something bad in it, we will know. OK. OK, right. thank you. Thanks so much. Yes, fine. Uh, Uh, absolutely. Um, just a second. Uh, that's a limitation. So, so I will actually not do that. Yes, because, uh, yes, yes. So we can't know all of the so gonna... attacks that might exist on okay. a similar okay. system implemented in the real world. So I guess the uh, so, short answer is that fun. that's a limitation. But I think this is something that we need because we can't wait till the actual commercial product is realized until we actually analyze it and discover it. Some we miss out on some attacks, but better to know early than wait until the end. So now for um, our last talk, it looks like we have a special guest speaker. Um, so uh, Kanlin Zhang and uh, Tushar Krishna uh, from Georgia Tech will be uh, talking about the most clever name of any of the talks today, uh, Loop 2.0 and uh, Network on Chip Visualization Tool for Kernel. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Kanlin, just verifying, can you hear me? Yes. And uh, I guess, can uh, yes. Uh, can everybody hear? Can, Lynn, if, can you just maybe speak up a couple sentences? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, Kenan, can you just say something again? Uh, yeah. Uh, can, 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 can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. Uh, so, so uh, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Tushar Krishna. I'm an associate professor at Georgia Tech. Uh, and with me on Zoom uh, is my student, Kanlin. He's actually in the Bay Area right now in an internship, so couldn't come here, but we decided to tag team. And we also have uh, Santana and Shashank. Uh, there are students who actually, you know, helped uh, us develop this tool uh, as part of a class project. So I thought, you know, more the merrier. Let's actually um, talk a little bit about what we've been developing. Um, so Kanlin, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is the broad outline. Uh, I'll briefly talk about Garnet, if uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with what that is. Um, and uh, motivate, uh, you know, what, what we are trying to do here. 
and then go into the framework we've developed called Loop 2.0. Uh, then we'll do a demo uh, and then uh, you know just talk about current status and future work. So next slide. Um, so so deadlock freedom is actually crucial for developing functionally correct systems, right? So deadlock is one of those things where it's not a performance argument, it's a correctness argument. You need your system to guarantee that there are no deadlocks, right? And of course, deadlocks occur at various parts of a system, right? There's OS level deadlocks, there's cache coherence protocol level deadlocks, and there's network level deadlocks. So, so within a network, a deadlock occurs when you have, let's say, a set of packets that uh, are in a cyclic dependence. And, um, and of course, this is something we don't want. And so there's a lot of solutions out there for you know, making sure your networks are deadlock free. And by networks here, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on on-chip networks, but this is kind of a general concept uh, for any interconnection network. So you have proactive solutions where you ensure that you, know, you never get into a deadlock in the first place. You need very clever routing algorithms to do that. You have clever turn models. Or you have solutions that are more reactive or a term that we use subactive, where you, know, you just kind of make sure via clever flow control that you know you you never have these cycles like if the cycles get formed you get out of them or even if they form you kind of have clever ways to you know just get out of them uh, without having to uh, have the system break um so it's becoming a very hot research area uh, because of you know a lot of heterogeneity in emerging systems right so you have things like chiplets coming in you have different chiplets developed by different vendors you know you might have deadlock freedom on each of those chiplets but how do you guarantee the full system is deadlock free uh, you know, resiliency continues to be an issue where some maybe nodes just go down, right? So suddenly you don't have a regular topology anymore. And there's a lot of recent work uh, in this space uh, if you're interested to check it out. And so, of course, uh, a lot of this work has actually relied on Garnet. Garnet is great. You know, it allows you to model uh, the NOC uh, with a lot of parameters. You can try out different topologies, like all these, uh, you know, irregular topologies as well. And in fact, in one of the previous Gem5 workshops, we had talked about, you know, the current version of Garnet in Gem5. Uh, which actually allows you to model chiplet-based systems and a lot of these, uh, you know, interesting topologies. You can try out different routing algorithms, slow control techniques, and so on, right? And of course, you can do full system simulations. You can actually see whether your technique works, you know, whether the application was allowed to complete. So it's been a useful and proven tool for simulating deadlock free knock designs. So, Kandin, if you can go to the next slide. So how does deadlock, you know, detection work in it today so the way um so typically what you would do is let's say you would design a, a deadlock free knock you would simulate it using Garnet. And, you know, if there's hopefully if there's no deadlock, things are fine. If there is a deadlock, you know, you will have to somehow detect it during simulation. So this is at the design time. I'm talking about like, how do you design this, right? So you somehow this, the tool should tell you that there is a deadlock and you should be able to identify where the deadlock is and try and go and fix things, right? So maybe, you know, the, the protocol you came up with was actually buggy or maybe the routing algorithm you came up with was not implemented correctly. Maybe the flow control technique had some corner cases that you missed. So there's a lot of interesting, of course, very natural, right? You'll have to debug your code to do this. So if you click uh, next, Kenlin, um, the problem today is Garnet actually has limitations on deadlock detection. So if you go to the next slide, what it does is actually something very simple. There's, a, there's basically a counter that's sitting uh, and just monitoring if you know flits have made progress. Uh, it's I think believe uh, it's at the network interface. So once the simulation starts, you know you're kind of just there's a counter that's checking if things are moving forward from the network interface into the into the router, um, and you keep counting. And if you know beyond a certain threshold, if nothing has moved, you just trigger an alarm and say that there's a deadlock. Right. That's it. So that's basically what Garnet does today, uh, which is essentially just timing out on a certain link. But that's all. Which is, of course, challenging if you want to really, you know, design a deadlock free topology or a deadlock free routing algorithm. You really want to know where the deadlock is, which routers were involved, or which specific packets were involved in it to allow you to uh, to, to debug it. So if you go to the next slide, um, so this is kind of the motivation of Loop. So I'll kind of now hand it over to Canlin to walk over what Loop does, uh, how it plugs into Garnet, and how it actually allows you to visualize the network and then uh, debug it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. So basically, here's the overlook, overview of the loop tool. So basically, loop consists of three parts. A patch inside Garnet, which generates traces during simulation. And the patch will produce a trace file, that's the second part, that, that captures cycle by cycle network states. Basically, it includes all the fluids inside each router and each link at one simulation cycle for the entire network. Then the a visualizer. That's the third part. It actually loads the trace and visualizes the network, and it's able to detect the deadlocks. So, by using the loop tool, we have we have changed the workflow of detecting deadlocks 
previously is mainly guesswork because it, it relies on very a very naive method. However, uh, using currently using loop, uh, even though the, the halting of the simulation is still like based on a threshold, but previously no information is generated. It just simply echoes a potential deadlock and nothing happens. Here, we actually generate a trace containing the network info, then we analyze it so we can more effectively see what is going wrong with maybe a full control, routing, routing algorithm, or some other stuff. So we, we basically have an easier debugging process with Loop. So there are, there are several aspects of Loop I want to talk about. First, I want to talk about how actually is the trace generated, basically how actually the patch works. So Garnet simulates a very complete, a detailed microarchitecture of the router. It has different stages and it corresponds to different Garnet implementation. So basically when, when a foot enters the, enters the router and tries to get out, it basically goes through this stage in a pipeline-like manner. So it's buffer right, compute route, arbitrate which VC to go, allocate allocate which switch, like it traverse traverse the crossbar and then goes to the goes to the output, goes goes to a link to go to the next router. So the loop trace generation happens in buffer right, which is the input unit, and link traversal, uh, which occurs in network link network link. So basically Every time when an input router wakes up, like it handles the foot input, either from the other router or from or being injected from a network interface by generated by the CPU, it will it will write a line, an entry into the trace file of that foot, which I'll explain later. The same goes for the network links. So for each network link, because at each cycle it will consume, if any. Flip, and you flip into a network link to simulate this traversal in, uh, into the link. So the same goes for a network link. So this approach is actually incremental for each for each cycle. Instead of trying to get get a snapshot of the complete state of the network, we only we, we only counted that either the flits uh, the flits which either are moving because it goes into either goes into the input unit or it goes into a link or are newly generated by CPU, basically injected by CPU into the input unit. So it's an incremental approach of generating the trace file. So now let's talk about the trace file. After each simulation, the trace file is a CSV file. So this is the overall structure of the trace file. At the top of the line, the first line, we have the network info for the visualizer to kind of detect what topology it is, what was the dimension of that topology of the network, the number of VCs for each router, etc. That's the network info for the visualizer to read. And then basically we have we have every flip in the network or it's the incremental approach during the first simulation cycle, second simulation cycle, and all the way to the last simulation cycle. So how does each entry work? Uh, the structure of the trace entry is well, it's complicated, but it's structured. We have, we, intuitively, we have the cycle number. We have whether the, this flip is currently in a router, in a router buffer, or in link. If if it is in a router, we have the router ID. We have the input. We have its input port, and then we have a bunch of info, exact info on the flip. So for the flip ID. Each flip in Garnet is assigned a unique ID upon creation. So in that way, we can effectively trace, it, trace the flip. Then we have the type of flip. It, the flip can either be head, tail, body, or head plus tail if the packet is one size, only has size of one flip. Uh, it's virtual network, which VC, a source, destination, and the flip creation time, a bunch of stuff. Then it has an output port, basically which output port the flip has been decided to go. Then we have the time it stayed. Basically, how, how, how much time has the flip stayed in the same buffer? That's more for debugging purposes to see like how long has the flip stuck. 
So this ends in phase generation. Let's go to the actual visualization of the network. So this is the main visualization GUI. It basically contains three parts. Basically, this part, this part, and this part. The left, uh, the left one is the statistics view, which I'll explain later. The middle one is the most important one, is the network visualization. Uh, currently, this example is visualizing a 4x4 four four mesh which, uh, with 8 VC per, uh, per port in the router. So this is the core buffer. It has this is the north north port north north alpha buffer north buffer VC like that, and then we have a close up view of each router, which actually displays displays the complete information for every foot in the VC, if any. And here are the deadlock checking function here, which I will explain later in the demo. So first is a network visualization. So it re basically reads the trace file and visualize the network. And each, each foot will be assigned a unique color, a, a random color, that is. And here is the visualization of a single router. Here's the router ID. Here's the actual VCs. And the, the, here are the links. So the, the reason there are two links because, well, if the links are bi-directional, so we want to differentiate between the directions. Currently, uh, Loop only supports mesh topology with arbitrary sizes. However, more topology will be supported in the future. So this is the close-up view of a uh, close-up core view of the Loop. We have a uh, we can select between which virtual network and which core basically which router, and we can select which buffer we want to display in this table. And then we have then we have the complete info of the flood, if any, inside, inside this buffer in the router. For example, we select the south buffer in core 10. And basically, we're in this table, we're displaying this one, the south buffer of router 10. So as we can see in VC3, we do have a flood, and here's this complete information. Another interesting thing we introduced is a kind of a usage heat map. So loop generates stats for router buffer usage during simulation. That is, for example, the entire, let's say the entire simulation lasts 5,000 cycles. And for for each buffer, we kind of uh, we kind of have a statistics that out of this five thousand cycles, how many cycle is the this buffer occupied? The more in the simulation cycle that is occupied, the more red it is. If it's completely used, it it's just blue. So we have a color gradient that indicates the occupancy of the occupancy of the buffer during the simulation. It actually has led some, we can actually do some interesting observation here. Here's an example. It has the, it's the four by four mesh. It has, uh, it has completely the same injection rate. It has the completely same dimension, same simulation cycles. However, you can see there, there is a distinct difference between tornado traffic and uniform random traffic. In, because tornado traffic only traverses on the same on the same row, it does not it does not, it does not go the traffic does not go between rows. So you can see for each router, the north and the south buffer are completely un unutilized. However, for the uniform random traffic, things are very different. You can see all the all the buffers are some are kind of. Uh, utilized kind of evenly, as you can see. So uh, we, we believe uh, this can be extended to do some very interesting observation. However, uh, this framework is highly flexible. It's, it can uh, not only be used for 
there is statistics it can uh, statistics for the VC utilization it can be done for that other stuff so here so then here's the deadlock visualization so currently loop uses a recursive algorithm to detect cyclic dependency for among multiple flips so to check the deadlock in the tool we have three options we can check every flip in the network for potential deadlock cyclic dependencies we can select the flip and ch and check for its deadlock or we can just enter a flip id for deadlock which I will, I will all demo very soon. So the splits involving deadlock will, will be marked in red. So let me just here, with time check. I know we're at five or five. Should we have the demo or should we? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, here, here's a here's a demo. Here, here, here's let's a demo. Just have a here. quick demo then, uh, can because we're already uh, yes. time. So uh, yeah, here, 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 I, here I loaded the file which actually don't do the full thing. Yeah, uh, I've already loaded the file. Uh, that's, this is a simulation that ended up actually uh, actually have a deadlock. So let, let's see if we clicked on the continuous check. Well, deadlock occurred. The, the red are in, uh, involving a deadlock. However, I have to point out that a uh, loop does, does not treat live lock, protocol li live lock here. Let's say uh, core five. This foot. This foot is already in uh, is already in the local buffer and it should be consumed. However, there might be some reason uh, in, in a protocol level that prevents it, prevents it from being consumed, so we don't count that as deadlock here. Uh, then you can select several floods here. Let, let's say those three and check whether they are deadlocked. So we would just Click the continuous deadlock check for selected flips, and they they are in, they are deadlock indeed. And the routers in loops basically means the routers involved in this cyc cyclic dependency will be marked in purple. So basically, after after each after each uh, after each simulation, you load up the trays, it goes through the cycles. Uh, this deadlock uh, mostly occurred at the very end of the simulation uh, and and all the stuff so yeah uh, and as you can see here are the detailed information for the for the uh, for the buffer and all the stuff just as just as we talked about so yes uh, you can you can try out the tool we will uh, I'll talk about the current status and how to access this tool. It's being actively developed. It works with the latest version of mainline Gen 5, which uh, we'll, uh, we'll make sure of that. Uh, it works with the latest Garnet. We plan to loop, uh, push this entire patch and visualizer for review, view, review and expect this will be merged into a mainline Gen 5 soon. And we will have a blog post of that. Uh, after this presentation. Currently, it's in the private re repository. Uh, I and the other students are maintaining it. To access, you can contact me or a professor to share. So, and here's some future words I'll briefly go through. We want to directly move this recursive detection algorithm to, to Garnet because it, to completely replace the threshold base to have a more accurate deadlock detection in the first place. Then we want a separate C++ class for trace generation. Currently, it's quite intrusive. We directly modify the unit and the links in implementation. We want, to, we, we want the trace generation to be a separate class. Then we have want live visualization during simulation. Basically, we just want when you invoke Gen 5, you run and it automatically kind of launches loop if you, if you want. And finally, we will try to support biologies. The first will be, we will aim on this butterfly and Venetian probably crossbar and that. So here concludes the presentation. Uh, I'm open to any question and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. What's uh, the performance overhead 
taking all these traces? Uh, the the detection uh, algorithm, I would say, is not the most efficient. It's actually far from it because it's very it's recursive. I mean, we did encounter down, uh, a problem. Traces, right? um, I, I think, yes, the loop itself will like have to detect the deadlock, which is slow. But for just yes. generating the traces, I think that's what Jason's question is around. Like, will Gem5 simulation suddenly become much slower? Because um, I don't think so. I've run, uh, I, I don't think it impacts the performance that much. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't notice a very significant difference in, in the performance when, at, when enable loop in the, for trace generation. Okay, thanks. Any other quick questions? Great. Well, this looks like a really cool tool, and I'd love to talk more about getting it upstream. Yep. Awesome. Right. Thanks. Uh, All right. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. guys. Okay. Well, I think that concludes our workshop today. Thank you all very much for attending. Um, yeah, I think, uh, kind of like I said at the end of my um, talk earlier, you know, I really want this to be a community pro project. Um, all of you are part of the community. So if you have ideas on improving Gym 5, um, do it. We'll accept your changes. Or come talk to us, and we can work together uh, to keep improving this uh, infrastructure for everybody. Um, I'll be around. If you have cool ideas, or send me an email. You can Google my name and figure it out. Um, yeah, happy to keep working with you. Thanks so much for attending, and uh, we will see you next time.